It is 9.30. Welcome back to this water right change petition hearing for the California Water Fix Project. I am Tam Doduck, presiding over a somewhat empty hearing room today. To my right is board chair and co-hearing officer Felicia Marcus. To my left, Andrew Derringer and Jean McHugh. We're interested, we're being assisted today by Ms. Galen. Congratulations, Ms. Galen, on selecting the law school that will be fortunate enough to have you amongst their ranks. Ms. Galen, would you like to share? Uh, Vermont Law School. All right, um, usual three announcements. In the event of an emergency, please note the nearest exit to you because we will be taking it to go down the stairs to the first floor and meet up in the park across the street. If you're not able to use the stairs, please flag down one of the safety people and you will be directed into a protective area. We've also been enjoying the drill that has been happening at least once a day, I think, every day that we've been in hearing these past few weeks. So in that event, actually we have not had to evacuate yet, which means it could be our time any day now, but an alarm will sound and we will, unless the lights are flashing and it's really apparent that it's the alarm for this floor and this room, in which case we will evacuate immediately. Otherwise, if you just hear an alarm going off in the background, we'll sit here and wait for the announcements. Uh, that was the first announcement. Second announcement, this hearing is being recorded and webcasted, so please provide your commentaries into the microphone after making sure that it is on, that the green light is lit, and begin by stating your name and affiliation for the record. We have our court reporter back with us, thank you. If you would like a copy of the transcript prior to the completion of part two, please make your arrangements directly with her. And finally, and most importantly, please take a moment and put all your noise-making devices to silent, vibrate, do not disturb, or even airplane mode. All right, with that, are there any housekeeping matters we need to address? Ms. Dejardin. Um, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, the board has made um, two transcripts available early, but I wanted to request that since there's uh, extensive testimony by the petitioners on uh, terrestrial impacts and engineering, um, I think primarily by John Bednarski and Christopher Earle, and the project has changed, that the, the board consider uh, making the transcripts for that testimony available. It's a significant expense for uh, protestants to purchase the transcripts. I think it's about $700 a day. But if the tes testimony of the wit witnesses who testified on terrestrial and engineering impacts and the cross-examination was available, it would help considerably with rebuttal. And are those the only two witnesses for which you're seeking the transcript of their testimony and cross-examination? Does, um, um, I believe also uh, Rish Beter, but no, I think Rish Beter was aquatic impacts mostly. He was water quality plant. Rish Beter might have had some too. He was a parks witness. Why don't you submit a, a request to the email List so that everyone knows what you're requesting and that way we know specifically which witnesses you're interested in. Thank you very much. Okay, and we will look into that. Mr. Brodsky. Uh, good morning, Michael Brodsky. You uh, good morning, Michael. Use the taller one. I hurt your, I feel your back for you. Okay. <laughs> the, the button to turn it on is actually on top of the microphone. There's a slider there. Is this on? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Good. 
Uh, yes. Good I morning, do. Michael Brodsky on behalf of Save the California Delta Alliance. As you can tell, I haven't been here in a while. It's good to see you again. I just want to let you know we're here today with our witnesses. We're ready to go. It's my understanding Mr. Porgaines will go first and, and then we'll follow. Yes. Um, I apologize for failing to inform my witnesses that it's casual Friday, but I did uh, wear a matching t-shirt and shoes. Yes, but they're in red. I don't know about that, Mr. Brodsky. So I did my best. <laughs> thank you. You did. Thank you very much. And thank you for remembering Casual Friday. We are attending a memorial service later today since we are violating our own Casual Friday rules. But I'm glad to see Mr. Brodsky on top of things. All right. If there are no other housekeeping matter, at this time, I'll turn to Mr. Porgans and thank him for returning today and ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth? Thank you. Be seated and uh, let's make sure your microphone is on, that the green light is lit so that we can hear you. There should be a button, Ms. Oh, Galen. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Perfect, Good. thank you. Uh -huh. All right, Mr. Porgans. Yes, my name is Patrick Porgans. That's P is in Patrick, O-R-G-A-N-S. And I'm a government regulatory specialist and a de facto public trustee. And my client is Planetary Solutionaries. And uh, today I'm here to uh, address some of the issues and concerns that I raised uh, uh, during these proceedings. Um, if they would uh, exhibit, uh, Porgan's Exhibit 326 up. And I'll briefly review some of the issues I'm gonna be discussing. And if I'm out of order at any time, I'll know that the chairs will let me know. And I'm not gonna try to read things verbatim, but there will be a few quotes I do have to emphasize because I realize uh, reading things is not the best thing to do. At any rate, there's five issues that I'm going to be discussing today. And one would be the environmental, uh, can you pull that down just a tad, please? So the, everyone can see the five issues. So I'll be talking about the uh, environmental degradation and uh, of the endangered species and compliance with the delta uh, dependent uh, species decline. I'll be talking about the uh, litany of broken promises you know, over the last 45 years uh, because as everyone knows you have been involved in this process for 45 years. And then the other thing I'll be talking about the levy failure or potential levy failures and a dual path. Uh, that's just in case we need to back up uh, in the event that the levees go while well, this process, process is going on to protect all of the water users and uses in the Delta. And I'll be talking about this um, disturbing um, pattern of uh, non-compliance and project operation during the drought. And lastly, I'll be talking about the, briefly the Public Records Act request for ex parte communications. So with that said, uh, I want to mention that uh, we, we, we recognize a significant decline in our anadromous fisheries over the last 40, 40 years. And a lot of this is happening because uh, I looked at the data, and again, my, my information is, is based on the government records. So um, it appears to me that uh, pre-project, uh, we were still having problems, but post-project, it appears that the problems have been exacerbated. And a part, part of that has to do with this increasing demand during certain types of years, water years. It's not a constant. It just appears to be uh, magnifying. Uh, when we have low flows, we don't have storage on the upstream reservoirs, and then we have problems with uh, having to come back to this board and request to UCPs, um, which, you know, under the circumstances at times, it's very necessary because we want to make sure everybody's got enough water for their basic needs. 
the uh, problem, though, is that um, I'm looking at all the data, and uh, we've had a lot of experts here, and, and, and the problem with experts uh, is that everybody has their limited perception of that part of what they're an expert about. There's very few people that have a comprehensive understanding of all these variables that are involved in this very complex issue. Uh, so what's happened is, and as you know, in the past, I've done everything I could as, a, as an individual to try to, uh, and I don't eat fish. I don't fish, okay? So this is not about me. As a matter of fact, it's not about anybody in this room. This is about the people. This is about the future. This is about ensuring that we have a delta that's viable, uh, and at the same time be able to provide water. Uh, my record shows that I don't oppose projects. What I do is I provide information, and if a project has uh, a value and it can pay for itself, I've always stood back. I'm saying we don't need this project, and I'll explain that to you why in a few minutes. So looking at the, uh, the precipitous decline in the species, um, the information shows that if we looked at the data, uh, for example, just the state water project from 1984 through 2006, uh, we were um, killing one million fish a year just at the state water project pumps. And that doesn't count predation. Um, so that kind of, it works down to about two fish a minute. For, and these are anadromous fish I'm talking about. I'm not talking about pelagic fish. I'm just talking anadromous fish. And I don't know if you've heard any of this before, but um, if you have, forgive me for repeating myself. And also, I have to be excused because of you know, my condition. So um, anyway, um, the other problem I'm having is, and I'm going to read a quote now. If we can go down to page, uh, the, the page two, uh, down to the, uh, the bottom of that. Uh, see, that's, and keep going down. That's the uh, rate of decline. Uh, would you go down? Hold on right there. Let me see what we're at. Down to the bottom of that page, I believe. Uh, let's see, can you go to, uh, I hope I didn't pass it. Okay, um, okay, yeah, go back just up a little bit, see where that line 21 is? Yeah. Okay, so what we're looking at here, this is a quotation, and all my references are right there at the bottom of that uh, page. It says, over the past 150 years, uh, California uh, native fisheries, um, a broad indicator of aquatic health, uh, in the ecosystem have lost almost every conflict with economic development. Among the state's 129 native fish, seven became extinct, 31 under listed and threatened or endangered under state and federal ESA, and um, another 69 are in decline and likely, um, uh, let's see, and, and will likely uh, qualify uh, for listing sometime in the near future. Only 22 native fish species are reasonably secure. And then on line 22, California will lose more than half, 52% of its native anadromous migratory salmonids and over a quarter, 27% of the inland salmonids in the next 50 years, uh, if the present trends continue. Uh, the 200, uh, 2009 biological opinion uh, for salmonids uh, uh, reported high pre-screen losses in the Clifton Court Forebay. An Endangered Species Act listed salmonids with 75 to 80% loss due to predation. So um, what it is is the conservation status of the California uh, salmonids, both individually and in the aggregate, was looking at, I'm on line 34, uh, coho salmon number in the hundreds of thousands only 50 years ago. And um, now today the numbers are in the hundreds. Uh, that's a very significant uh, decline. Now we can move to the next page, top of the page. So uh, I'm, I'm on line four now. Uh, likewise, the combined abundance of uh, Sh Chinook salmon and ESUs in the Central Valley once aggregated around two million fish annually. Today, uh, there are three runs, spring, winter, 
and uh, late fall average only a few thousand fish. Uh, the, the fall run has recently been experiencing extreme annual fluctuations in abundance, reaching an all-time low of 66,000 in 2008. Now we have to be mindful of the fact that we're spending significant sums of money here. We're in the billions now uh, to try to bring these fish back. And we know that if by looking at the data, and I, I think it's, uh, if we can bring up uh, cow spots, I think it's 239. Uh, we take a look at the uh, Anatomous Fish Restoration Program, and in that graph, it's gonna show us, you know, what's happened since uh, the CVPIA became operable, uh, including what happened with the $500 million from the California Water Fund, you know, that uh, uh, for the EWA, Human Environmental Water Account. And uh, I looked at all the data, and I couldn't find any information that with QA or QC that that information was in effect, um, um, you know, proved that there was any increase in the populations. Um, uh, and that, I found that to be very disconcerting because, you know, when you spend that kind of money, you want to see some results. And then I started looking at the, um, the B2 water, you know, on the 800,000 acre feet. And uh, there were several reports that came out and one was listen to the river that was by that independent science panel, the CVPIA. And I, I, I've been trying to track that water for almost a decade. And what I found out is, and I, I do have this all confirmed in writing, it's not in my exhibits, but it is you know, referred to in this testimony. That that 800,000 acre feet, um, I wanted to know how much of the water is being recaptured, which I think is very important. Uh, I get two different conflicting uh, stories on that one. Uh, the um, Bureau of Reclamation contends they cannot tell me, well, it's impossible to discern how much of that water, that 800,000 that's going out every year, uh, depending on the type of water year, is actually being picked back up. Now the independent science review uh, on the Listen to the River is their contention uh, that almost all of it's being picked up. So I, I brought this issue to the uh, water master, the Delta water master's attention, uh, because I think we need to know a little bit more about that. If in fact uh, that water is being recaptured, and if in fact we need some water to move these fish out at certain periods of time, then I'm, I'm starting to look at maybe advantageous for this board to consider looking at ways to uh, create a, a salmon or an anadromous fish water bank. So we can come back later on and say, like, maybe if they got 600,000 one year, maybe we can put 200,000 that aside for fish or for other purposes to meet the D1641 or whatever purpose that, 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 may, that may apply. Now, I'm going into, um, if we can go down here to line 25 and just below that. Okay, so after 50 years of monitoring, fish loss guesstimates face a high degree of uncertainties. Experts assert high degree of uncertainties to, as to the lost estimates. So if we look at line 32, uh, it tells us there uh, DWR and reclamation qualified incidental take for listed species to the nearest tall fish. Um, but the current methods of uh, ascertaining those numbers are up in the air. The experts are debating, you know, still how many fish are actually being taken. So we don't know that. Uh, and these numbers that I'm providing you with, these numbers, uh, they're, they're skewed, they're low, and quite frankly, I don't have any confidence in those numbers. So, uh, and, and, and again, did we ever get to that, uh, to that uh, CalSpar, I think it was 239? I just wanted to show you what we're talking about, and maybe you've seen this before. Now, this, this is not the latest one. Uh, I did have the latest one, but I didn't get to submit it. But the um, fish populations are still uh, below the 2014, 15, and 16. So, I mean, this is a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and this is what we have after. And don't forget that this was supposed to be completed by 2002. 
And there, I don't see where there's any way we can hold anybody accountable for this. I mean, we come up with RPAs and they implement the RPAs and then we come back and they pass the deadline on the RPAs and then it's almost like it's put back on the back shelf, which is a problem because if this board is trying to get to provide that level of protection and those changes aren't showing us benefits, then what we have here is a situation where we need to come back and do QA on this one, see what's happening. So thank you for putting that up there. And if we can go back to uh, Corgan's um, 326, and I'm gonna go down to page, uh, looks like page three. It starts off a page uh, three, line 22 at the top of the, uh, let's see where we are here. Could you, uh, is that the first? Let me see what page you are. That's page three. Uh, go back up. Okay, so a little more, please. Okay, hold on right there. Come back, come back. Thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're we're going to go, go back down again. I'm sorry about that. And next page. Okay, let me look what, what we got here. So uh, if I'm looking at, um, that's on a line two, on line three, you know, the 2013-40 DOS report uh, tells us there's still a high degree of uncertainty using current methods uh, for the loss of incidental take. Now the problem with this incidental take is that, uh, and when we set these objectives for whatever they may be uh, at the time that uh, the agreements are made, it seems to me what's happening is that they come back and they reinstitute the, uh, the take uh, limits, or they'll make some simple modifications, but in the end, it doesn't really get us any more fish. So there's a problem there. Um, so moving along there, and there's the, the cross uh, delta channel. Now we know that when those reservoirs are low during the dry periods, uh, it's because uh, most of, uh, a lot of water is being delivered in the early years of the drought, you know, the pre-drought the pre years. And then what we're doing is we're coming back here, uh, the, um, the department and the bureau, and then that's when they're asking for the TUCPs. So then what happens is we may have to open up the gates uh, on the Delta Cross Channel, you know, and then when we have those out-migrating salmon uh, and other anadromous fisheries, we're, uh, we're increasing our loss rates. So uh, those kinds of issues there we need to look at because I've been involved in every drought since 77, 76, 80, uh, 87, 292, and subsequent to that time. And each time, that's exactly what's happened. They come back, and, and it's not you know the board's fault because you're only dealing with what's, what you have to deal with. So at any rate, if we can move that down just a little bit more so we can see what's underneath there. Okay, hold on there, thank you. So it says here on line 22, the proportion of juvenile winter run population losses at the Delta facilities each year is correlated to the Sacramento River flow diverted into the interior delta um, during the time juvenile winter run and I'm uh, uh, emigrating uh, through the uh, Sacramento River in the vicinity of the Delta Cross Channel. So what I'm, I'm looking at here is that uh, you know we can take these precautions, we can implement all of the regulation, all everything we have, but when we have to come back and open those gates during those critical periods, all we're doing is creating more problems. Now, it's my contention that there's, and this, um, and this is going to be a shocker. There is no water shortage in California. I'm sorry, I, I, I have 79 fact-finding volumes on water. What I, what we have here is a. Um, uh, uh, a distribution issue. I mean, as I mentioned to you uh, in before during these proceedings when we had to come in and implement the drought regulations, we were putting in 60,000 acres of almonds a year for 10 years straight. Uh, almonds now use 3.7 million acre feet of water. And if you put that in perspective and look at, say, for example, the Metropolitan Water District, uh, their entire water demands on average is only 2.1 million acre feet. And we do have to remember that uh, the Met provides water to San Diego Water and Power and to the Los Angeles uh, uh, Water uh, Authority, excuse me, Water and Power. So what we need to do here, and, and again, it's not just about fish. 
This is, and it's not, this is, this is, uh, we're talking here about the last remaining Delta on the West Coast of the, of, the, of the Americas. So when we make a decision now, this decision is gonna, you know, this is the ultimate fate of something that we all are very familiar with and dear to. And it's not ours. So I, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize to you, and I'm, I'm getting on now in the years. I don't know how many more times I can come back here. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, and I, I realize that you know sometimes I'm a little harsh, sometimes I'm direct, and, and I, I don't mean to be offensive, but you understand that you know, it's like trying to teach my child not to run out in front of the car until we're both killed, and it's not good. So anyway, moving along here, um, I'll go down to the next page. Uh, let's see here. Uh, actually, um, title 24. So, um, okay, I'm on line 12, and I'm looking at my 15 years, looking at what's happening there with DWR and the Bureau. And on line 16, I'm talking about uh, Title 34, uh, CVPIA. And I'm, I'm looking again back at, you know, what we said we were going to do and what we haven't done. And then I'm looking back on 27, and I'm looking at the amount of money that's been spent on the CVPIA, and these numbers are very fresh. At 1.7 billion, about 60, 63% of that has gone toward fisheries. Um, and, uh, and, and money for uh, purchasing water for fish. <laughs> yeah, I always thought fish lived in water. I didn't know we had to buy water for them. But, and that's another issue. Because what's happening here is they're not only getting to pay us to pay them for the water that we are providing to them, they're getting that water back again. And then whatever they do with that water, you know, they could be marketing the water or whatever, and they're making money. So what I'm saying is that we have to look at a better way to uh, utilize that resource in a manner in which uh, we can reduce the cost apply whatever the benefits are across the board. So that this way, am I, is my 20 minutes up? It is. Uh, could I, 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 may I ask for a few more minutes here because uh, I, I didn't um, um, apply for my opening statement uh, and I should have done that. I found out that later, so I'm, I'm sorry. So you have a few more key issues, I believe, in your testimony. Which ones do you would like to focus on? Well, I think we should focus, let me go back to my, um, uh, okay, I wanna talk about the broken promises and I wanna talk about the, um, the issues regarding why we don't have the level of protection in the river, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, in the Delta. Now, you know, we're here with the California water fix today and um, the water fix itself, um, uh, you know, it may be necessary to some degree, it's just how we're gonna go about doing it. Um, we know now, and the data indicate, and it's in the water code, section 12934D, that we were supposed to have master levees in the Delta uh, back in 1960. They never were built, okay? Then we went into the peripheral canal, we know where that went, went down. And now we're here talking about tunnels. Now, if you look at the amount of water that it takes to irrigate uh, one acre of land on Sherman Island, for example, it's a 40 to one ratio, 40 to one. So uh, if you take a, a year like 1928, um, we would have had to push out 289,000 acre feet of water in order to meet uh, the Edmonton standard. Uh, and under the provisions of the North Delta Water uh, co Agency uh, contract. Um, so the Delta, uh, that island is now purchased by the Department of Water Resources. So in some years now, if we're not growing something there, um, there could be the possibility of increasing your yield from that particular um, ac acquisition because we're not using it for that purposes. Uh, they had mill moved that uh, standard up to Three Mile Island, which did save them some water. Now, if they would have went along with the BDCP and purchased another 100,000 acres of uh, land in the Delta out on the southwestern fringe, we also could have reduced the amount of water that we would need to meet those standards. So what I'm saying is that to get 250,000 acre feet of water, which you don't have to push out of the reservoir, that's like firm yield. To get that same amount of water, you'd have to fill the reservoir about a million acre feet. 
So there is water in the system. It's a matter of how you, you, you apply the water under whatever conditions that are appropriate under the, uh, under the circumstances that exist. So what I'm saying is that for all those years, we never did get that protection. So we're now in a situation where we all know that USGS and others, uh, authoritative people, uh, show us that there, we can have levee failures in the, in the summertime, not just the winter. So my concern is, is that we need to have some assurances that in the event we're you know, constructing out there for 13 years uh, and something did happen where you know, we had a major level uh, of levee failure, we need to be in a situation where we can provide assurances that we're going to be able to provide the quality of water that's necessary to meet the standards that this board has set. And we're gonna have to be in the position that someone's gonna have to be held responsible for this in the event that something does happen. So those, th those responsibilities have to be borne by the, the real beneficiaries uh, of the projects because that the projects are putting the impacts on us. Now I have to say, and this is very important, that if you go back to Bulletin 132.63 uh, and, and you look at, uh, it's about page 90, 95, in that document, and I did submit that as part of my evidence, and I don't wanna have to be pulling all my exhibits up here, uh, but it shows us that in the situation with the Department of Water Resources, uh, they were um, depending on the surplus flows in the Delta up until about 1990. That didn't happen. We, we don't have those surplus flows now. So now we're going after the abandoned water and we're going after the water that's being recaptured. Uh, you know, so that's putting additional stresses on um, all the, both the pelagic and also the anadromous fisheries. Okay, I'm almost done. And, and again, uh, forgive me for having to go through all this stuff, but uh, it's one of those situations where we gotta get to the, to, to the root of the problem here. Now, and one thing I would like to make clear, I have nothing personal against anyone in this room, okay? This is not about my personality or yours. This is about something, it's a trust resource. It's something that we have an obligation, uh, not just to, you know, as, as, as regulators, but as human beings uh, to uh, take in this to account so that this way, when we know future generations are here, that they're gonna have something that we didn't lose. And I'm saying to you, we're exporting a lot of our water in these commodities. And we're, we need to start asking ourselves, what's, you know, if we're looking at agriculture, which you know, provides less than 2%, hmm, 2% of the $1 trillion, uh, the, the, uh, the, the one trillion plus dollars to this economy here in California, uh, two, two trillion dollars, we have to start asking ourselves, how much investment do we wanna make? And this was a choice we had to make about how we were gonna apply this water. We're gonna to have to ask ourselves, is it beneficial for us to take half of our crops and export them, and we're exporting our water and our energy at the same time, and then we're creating the degradation of these um, species that have been here for thousands of years. That's something we have to ask ourselves. So I'm gonna uh, surmise it, uh, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to, and I'm not gonna be able to get through everything, but I have confidence in, 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 in you board members because I know, I know some of you for years, you know, and I have a deep respect for you because I realize that this decision that you have to make is a very difficult one because no matter what decision you make, you're gonna be damned one way or the other. But I have to say, we have to look at the track record of the operators. That's a very important issue here. I'd like to believe that the department and the bureau is gonna be compliant you know, with you know, the regulations, but that's not what it, it tells us. When times get tough, you know, people get tougher. So we have to say to ourselves, yeah, that's true. You are in trouble, but did we create that problem? That's what we have to ask ourselves. And we have to say, what did you do to avoid that problem? So that this way you don't have to come back and put us in, in, in position because we didn't create it. That's, that's another key issue we have to consider. So anyway, on that note, I, I believe um, I, I, I'm gonna conclude only because you know, I don't wanna take any more of your time up and I, I do appreciate everything you've done. And you know, it may not have, you know, we don't always agree, but we can disagree and still you know, uh, get along.
But that's, that's about all I have to say to you guys, uh, do women and board members today. Thank you, Mr. Porgans. That appreciation goes both ways. I appreciate that. Uh, Cross-examination. Julianne Ainsley for the Department of Water Resources. At this time, we have no questions. Are there any cross-examination? Ms. Deja Dan. Why don't you go ahead and take a seat there and conduct your cross-examination from there. If you want to sit right here next to me, you can do that. Why don't you do that, Ms. Deja Dan? Maybe she can read my notes for me. <laughs> no slipping notes allowed. I'm okay, sorry. <laughs> no peeking. Chinese wall here. Um, and what is your time estimate, Ms. Dejadan? Um, I estimated 40 minutes. It may be shorter. All right, let's start you off with 30 minutes. Okay. And your topics? Um, the, um, the B2 water and the CVPIA and the assumptions and various board processes about the CVPIA and um, salvage losses and um, the four pumps agreement and um, the uh, also uh, what he referenced about uh, salmon decline, decline in salmon populations. All right, please begin. Okay, um, so first I'd like to bring up uh, exhibit Porgan's 326 corrected. Um, um, page six. And uh, at line 16, uh, and Mr. Porgans, um, you discuss here Title 34 of the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, and uh, it mandated 800,000 acre feet of water dedicated to fish and wildlife annually. That's correct. Were, were you uh, were you active in California water issues when the CVPIA was passed? I most certainly was. <laughs> was uh -huh. there a significant amount of hope that that would help restore salmon populations? That was the general concept, uh, yes. Um, and um, were you also around for the 1995 water quality control plan? Yes, I was, and I had input into that process. I, I wanted to bring up uh, exhibit SWRCB 30, which references a CVPIA. Um, and uh, let's go to uh, page uh, 28, which I believe is PDF page 38. Um, and scroll down, I believe, at the bottom. Um, no, that's page 29. There it is. Narrative objections for salmon protection. So are you familiar, do you remember the narrative objection for salmon protection being adopted in 95? Uh, yes, I do. Um, and so um, this specifically references um, uh, it being a CVPIA goal. Yes. Um, and let's go down to um, page 29 at the top. Um, so it says monitoring results will be considered in the ongoing review to evaluate achievement of this objective. Yes, I, a matter of fact, I was before this board raising my concern about that because I didn't believe that that um, uh, would provide a sufficient protection for the fisheries. And I was under the impression that we were gonna come back and look at that some, uh, some later time. 
Oh. All right, let's hold on. Ms. Ainsley? Yeah, so I have an objection. There was no question pending unless she was asking him, unless there was like a question mark at the end of that statement asking him what the document says. And at this time, I'm going to lodge an objection if we're going to walk through and ask him confirm what documents already in the record state. So, I, so far, I haven't heard a, a question there that asks for anything other than what that document states. Ms. Um, Ainsley, as much as I do not like the inf the inefficiency of that uh, method. You and others have done the same. So to a certain extent, Ms. Dejardin, as long as you move quickly through and you be sure to ask him for his opinion rather than just reiterating what he is reading, that would be more helpful. Um, and, and I was specifically asking Mr. Porgans how somebody was participating in and I was using this as a basis for the questions. All right, so let's proceed to your question. Um, hold, hold on to whatever you want to add for now. Um, Mr. Porgens, this also discusses development of numeric objectives to replace the narrative salmon doubling uh, requirement. Yes, uh, are you asking me, did I provide input? It, um, it, uh, did, I, do you remember discussion about uh, numeric salmon doubling objectives in the 95 water quality hearing? Yes, I do remember something to that effect. My mind is not clear, totally clear on that, but yes, I do remember it being discussed. Um, was there concern that numeric objectives were gonna be developed in the future? I, 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 I raised that concern. Um, have has the board ever revisited numeric objectives? Well, I think when we were in D1641, we were looking at it. Uh, and I, it was my understanding that uh, we were going to see what the results were, but we implemented D1641 uh, to see whether in fact what we had in place would it be effective enough to, to provide that protection. Um, well, That's well, what my understanding was. So I would like to bring up exhibit DDJ116. Um, um, which is the CalFed record of decision. Um, and uh, Mr. Porgans, are you familiar, you, you participated in the CalFed process, did oh, you not? I, I did, yes. Um, and uh, this is the programmatic record of decision. Um, are you familiar with this document? Yeah, I've read it. I would like to go to uh, uh, PDF page 58, which is page 55. Um, so this discusses the baseline level of protection um, and what was assumed there. Um, and I wanted to just, um, one of it, uh, it let's, let's go ahead and scroll down uh, to the next page. And it's one of the assumptions was full use of 800,000. Uh, do you see where it says one of the assumptions was full use of 800 TAF supply of water pursuant to section C? 3406B2 of the CVPIA in accordance with Interior's October 5th, 1999 decision. Uh, what paragraph are you on there? Um, the, where's a dot and it's in bold. Oh, I see it. Okay, give me a minute. Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. So, so, so it, at the time of CalFed, they assumed full use of the CVPIA, 800,000 acre feet. I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, in decision 1641, wasn't that also an assumption? I believe it was. Yeah. And if I may add to that without, if that's okay if I can add to it. I don't know. Yes, please, 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 I, please, that, please, that, please. I, mean, I don't wanna be, you know, do you have any other observations related to yeah, that? Yeah, I do have them because see, I, it took me at least three years to find out what, to, what was going on with that water. And I, I was upset about it because I, I couldn't find out just exactly how the water was being applied. And uh, I couldn't get answers out of the, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation and uh, I felt that uh, something was wrong. 
And um, now I've confirmed that. So um, I'd like to bring up uh, exhibit DDJ 289, please. Um, it's on the stick. It's under Porgan's Cross. Um, so, uh, Mr. Porgan's, uh, this is a memo from the United States Department of Interior um, to um, Fish and Wildlife and, and the Bureau of Reclamation in 2003. Um, do you recognize this doc letter? I have copies. Um, is, and it says CVPIA B2 at the top. Hmm. And it says, and, and it's uh, regarding guidance for implementation of section 3406 B2 of the CVPIA. Yes, I see that. Um, I'd like to scroll down to um, page two, please. And uh, at the top, so um, on the third sentence, um, I'm going to ask, I'd like to ask you about this sentence. It says, consistent with the June 3rd, 2003 Ninth Circuit decision, much of the B2 water that is dedicated and managed annually to help make fishery beneficial use and protection objectives of the 1995 Water Quality Control Plan serves Section 3406 B2's primary purpose of fish wildlife and habitat restoration. Are, 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 are you familiar with uh, this part of the decision? Yes, I've read it. Um, and, Matter of fact, I, don't, I probably, uh, I, to my recollection, I commented on that. I, di didn't this sort of change how the B2 accounting was done? Well, it appears to have had changes. Um, but again, you know what I'm saying, so we make ourselves clear here. I'm not trying to read into people's stuff. Uh, what they say they were doing and what happened are two different things. Um, and you referenced um, uh, you referenced uh, listen to the river um, and, and um, Bill Keir always. Uh, Always meant, or always referred to this. Um, uh, let's pull up exhibit DDJ 290, please. Um, so, um, Mr. Porgans, uh, this is Listen to the River, an independent review of the CVPIA fisheries program. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with this yeah, document? I a, yes, I have a copy with me. Um, so, let's, um, can we scroll down a little and see um, to the next page? Uh, further. Um, so this was an independent review of the CVPIA fisheries program. And, and, le and let's scroll down a little further. Um, and was prepared under contract with Circle Point for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and the Fish and Wildlife Service in December 2008. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'd like to go to page 51 of this document. Um, and let's scroll down, please. Um, and uh, please read uh, the um, the highlighted section in yellow. The panel expected to find the information. Oh, no, just, oh. just read it to yourself, Mr. Porgans. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry? Just read it to yourself. Oh, um, forgive me. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and let us know when you're done. Okay, and again, this is on document page 41 um, and uh, listen to the river, uh, exhibit DDJ 290. Um, the last paragraph. So, Mr. Porgans, um, the, so this discusses that the panel expected to find that um, the the agencies would identify a water budget and then uh, release the stored water and protect that flow through the rivers, through the delta, 
and into the bay, correct? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I read, and that's what they intend, they thought it was for, yeah. Well, um, would that be consistent with how you had um, argued that the board should, should meet the salmon doubling that <laughs> requirement? The, that's what the, um, uh, the intent of the purpose of the CVPIA was for. And I believe that had they used it and, and applied it accordingly, I think that it would have made a difference, yeah. Well, well, let's scroll down to the next page. Um, this is page 42 at the top. Um, do you see where the panel says that they were flabbergasted to learn that this is not how the agencies implement this provision? Yes, I did, and if I may um, you know, expand on that one. This is the reason why I made an effort to uh, contact the uh, Bureau of Reclamation and get to the bottom of where that 800,000 acre feet of water has gone to. And, um, uh, and I do have that document. So uh, I didn't, uh, that only reassured me that there was a, a problem with whether in fact the water was being applied in accordance with uh, the uh, 1992 CVPIA. That it confirmed it to me that it, it wasn't. Um, let, let me ask you specifically a little more about the panel's findings. So this says that reclamation releases approximately 400,000 acre feet from CVP storage each year um, aimed at supporting the needs of particular life stages at particular locations. Um, but then these augmented amounts are then diverted out of the system at a later point. That's the issue which we raised to the Bureau, is that's the recaptured Hold water. on, hold on, Ms. Ainsley. I am continually unclear on whether there is a question, question pending. So I would really appreciate it if there would be a question. I also object as to uh, I, I'm completely unclear under whether he, she's asking him to confirm what this article says about what the panel said and whether she's following it up with what his understanding is. And if it's basically what his understanding is, that's a different issue. So I would really appreciate a question at the end of reading something off the screen. I, 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 there's two. two. Ms. Dane, Ms. Deja Dan, just ask the yes. question. So um, is it... It, I, you know, are you concerned at this point um, uh, that uh, the B2 water is continuing to be uh, diverted out of the system? Yes. And, and were you able to get any kind of answers about the Bureau of Reclamation about whether that is happening? Uh, the response from the Bureau of Reclamation was that it's impossible to discern which water is being recaptured and for what purposes. Now it's my understanding, is, am I allowed to continue? Because she asked me a question. Or do I stop right there? If you're answering the question. Yeah, uh, yeah. so it's my understanding that uh, if the water is designated for um, uh, D1641 purposes and it's required to go out the bay, then that's not water they can recapture. But my concern was that they can't tell me or for that matter, anyone, they were saying it's impossible to discern how much water is being recaptured. I think that's, that's, that should be something this board and everyone else should uh, be interested in, in uh, obtaining. So, Mr. Porgens, um, in 2008, the panel found that approximately 400,000 acre feet of the panel was, of the water was just accounted for as pumping restrictions in the Delta. And I wanted to ask you if um, you were able to ascertain whether the Bureau is still accounting for about half the B2 water simply as export restrictions. As I said, they can't answer the question. I saw I can't answer that question. Um, and are you aware of any proposal for how the B2 water would be used in the water fix? No. Um, would you be concerned that they would export B2 water from the North Delta diversions? Uh, yes. A and would that be further north in the Delta? Yes. A and uh, provide even less flow for salmon? Yes, uh, I would. Um, 
So um, I'd like to pull up exhibit DDJ 287, please. Um, and uh, I believe you referenced this and that um, y y your concern, uh, that there's sort of a general concern in California that nearly half native salmon could go extinct in the next 15 years. Yeah, that's what- so Hold on, what was the question? I guess so, so he discussed this in his paper and I said, so, so you discussed this in your paper that there are concerns that nearly half the salmon could go extinct in the next uh, 50 years. Yes, Correct. that's a recent report that was published and uh, the people that published that report are people that have been involved in this issue for decades. So if they're saying that there's an issue and we're looking at the B, uh, at that um, um, C, C spot 239, I think that there is a concern. Let me pull up the exact uh, quote. Um, um, so I'd like to go to um, exhibit Porgens 326 corrected, uh, page three. Um, and so your testimony states that seven uh, of, this, of the state's 129 native fish, seven have become extinct. 31 are listed as threatened or endangered under the Federal and State Endangered Species Pact, and another 69 are in decline and will likely qualify for listing in the future. And your question is? Um, is, uh, you know, is it your understanding that a large percentage, so, so you refer to these statements, is it your understanding that a large percentage of California's native fish are uh, threatened or endangered? That's or what it extinct. says, Ms. Dejardin. Um, and, and is it your understanding that a, a large percentage are in decline and uh, you know are likely to qu qualify for listing. That's actually what it says. And so I'm still waiting for your um, my answer. You no, know, I'm waiting for her to ask a question beyond what's you know reading what's in your testimony. Well, I wanted to ask him. So so doesn't this does doesn't this quote show that there is major concerns about California's native fishes? What it indicates to me. And, um, you know, and that this board needs to take, would, would it be your, your concern based on this that the board needs to take more aggressive action to preserve these fish? Well, the board has the authority to do that. And I do believe that the board has done everything they could to try to um, um, alleviate, is that the word? ameliate, you know, to try to calm it down, to try to work it out. You've gone overboard. You've done everything. I don't think you can do anything else other than, you know, apply um, the jurisdiction you have in order to de develop specific flows that the project operators have to comply with. And I, I do believe uh, th that's one way we can start changing this, you know, maybe reverse this process. Um, so the, I, you also discuss um, the four pumps agreement and DFG's mitigation. And I, I'd like to bring up exhibit DDJ 288, please. Um, now let's, uh, um, Mr. Porgens, I believe, that, are you familiar with this document? It's a memorandum from Ms. Barbara McConnell to Department of Fish and Game. Yeah, I have that. Um, and let's uh, scroll down. So, so this uh, lists the um, the law, the five-year mean values for losses of fish. Yes. Correct. Correct. Um, and uh, um, there's, you know. 
um, like hundreds, over 100,000 striped bass in a five-year loss. Um, and your question 100, is? 100,000 salmon, uh, correct? And your question is? If, if there are, so given that there are 100,000 Chinook salmon listed as being a direct take, um, are, are you concerned about the level of take at the projects? Uh, yes, and even probably, if I may, and then if I'm out of order, tell me. I think if you go to the next page or the following. Now let, let's go to the next page. Uh, these are annual numbers. Um, and, and doesn't it say that a, a sampling program was eliminated on the footnote here? Yes, it does. Wouldn't, would you be concerned about that as well? Totally. Um, are, would you be concerned uh, about estimates of direct take at the North Delta diversions? If we have concerns about what's going on with the existing um, take in the numbers? Yes. I would have be, I'd be very concerned. Um, do you, um, and you also mentioned that uh, that there are concerns that uh, salvage uh, calculations aren't accurate enough? Well, yeah, it's in my testimony, and that's not my concern. It's the Department of Fish and Game's concern. Department of Fish and Game's. Would you like to see this board mandate that salvage estimates be improved? I think it would be helpful. Um, and that raw salvage numbers continue to be reported? Absolutely. Um, and would um, are, are you aware of how the um, bureau's salvage counts? Uh, what the staffing is for that? Well, uh, according to the information I received uh, from the bureau, um, uh, the maintenance people at Tracy. Uh, are uh, involved for the most part in um, making the observations every two hours for 15 minutes. And uh, then those numbers are provided uh, to the Department of Fish and Game and that uh, the Department of Fish and Game sometimes are available, you know, at the facility. But for the most part, those numbers are being counted by, and we now, we, we, we now know that um, the Mendota Water Authority is operating uh, those facilities with some guidance from the Bureau. So oh. I, 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 I'm concerned about that. So let me get this straight. So maintenance people supervised by the San Luis and Mel Delta Mendota Water Authority are doing the salvage counts? Uh, they're, they're doing the 15-minute um, inspections, but for the two-hour period that's required. Uh, now, that's information that came from the Bureau. So, you know, I'm not there. I haven't seen the maintenance people, and so I can't attest to the fact that it's the maintenance people. All I know is that's the information I received, okay? W would you like to see some kind of quality assurance? Uh, the board requires some kind of quality assurance process on the salvage counts. I, I believe that if we had somebody that was, you know, more independent, you know, and um, uh, that didn't have a, a, an agenda, uh, that was a, a, um, objective, it would give us better information. Um, and, and Mr. Agent Ann, you have about four minutes left. I encourage you to wrap up your cross-examination. Yeah, um, and Mr. Porgens, um, the, the project is proposing that the bypass criteria be determined by the presence of fish, uh, of salmon at a particular location. Um, what, would you be concerned if water agents, if that was based on water agency s staff? Ms. Ainsley? I'm gonna say objection, vague and ambiguous. I believe she means bypass criteria at the North Delta diversions, but I think she should make clear, more clear the facts in her question about what we're talking about. Um, Mr. Borgens, the bypass criteria for the North Delta diversions are proposed to be triggered by the presence of uh, winter run and spring run at 
uh, a, at a specific location in the Sacramento River. Um, would you be concerned if water agency staff were the ones monitoring those locations and determining the trigger? Ms. Ainsley? I also have a vague and ambiguous objection to the water agency staff. I think I'm a little unclear if she means like what what agency she's meaning, I'm, and by which I mean, does she mean the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, or does I she mean I think she's water meaning agency? not a regulatory agency. Yes, would you be concerned if, for example, San Luis and Delta Mendota staff were, um, were doing that monitoring? I believe it would be, be um, a conflict of interest. Uh, and if um, MWD paid staff were doing that monitoring? Totally. Um, and if DWR staff were doing that monitoring? I would have an objection to that. Um, and um, do do you think that uh, um, that DFG has more uh, independence? Okay, now I'm going to answer this question in a way where you know you can object to me. Anybody who wants to object, they can. I don't care. Um, if you look at the historical record. Uh, and I've done comprehensive reviews of every agency that's involved that we've discussed here so far. I'm a forensic accountant on public records. So what I'm saying is that um, uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in the Department of Fish and Game. And I don't, I, I do believe that we need something, somebody like from the board here we need a, a fisheries aid person that could at least oversee, at, uh, spot check them at least at times to see what's going on, to, make, to give us some level of assurances that the, the information we're being provided is accurate. Do, do you think that, for example, the board should mandate periodic independent reviews, completely independent reviews of the salvage monitoring and any monitoring at the North Delta diversions? Or, or, or for the purpose of determining bypass criteria? Well, in light of the fact that the experts are telling us that we're grossly underestimating loss now with you know th what's in place, and that tells me we do need something else to give us better information. So I would um, uh, suggest that uh, you would have to have someone else come in here and look at it. Uh, and I'm not available. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Forgans. That concludes my cross-examination. Thank you. Does that conclude your case in chief, Mr. Forgans? I, I, I would like to make one more comment, if I may, if that's okay. It's real. Uh, it might be subject to cross-examination, but well, go they ahead. Can, they can cross-examine me. I'm not. A, I'm not a. I, you know, I'm just telling you what. I, I, these are my, my opinions. I, believe me. So is your additional comment that you're making in response to the cross-examination Ms. Deja Dan just conducted? Yes, it, you know, it has to do with, you know. Go ahead. We, okay, now again, you know, you can stop me. Uh, when we did the 2014 to UCP, uh, it was under the understanding that we were gonna provide cold water for fish up there at, uh, you know, below the uh, Shasta and, and Red Bluff area. And at that time, you know, I, I did come here, I did testify, I did object. I said, I don't see how it's gonna happen. And we lost 95% of those fish. No one has been held accountable for one of those dead fish. And I'm, I'm in the process, and they better hope I don't hit the lottery, okay? Yeah, why is that important? I'd have all the money I need to go after them. Uh, because I'm, I'm concerned if, I'm, if, if you have a law, when the highway patrol pulls you over for going over the speed limit, that person, man or woman, is doing their job. That's, I'm wrong, so I have to take that ticket. If I have no disincentive, and I'm gonna drive like a maniac, and I'm a high-speed performance driver, uh, then I, I have to face the consequences. All right. Thank you. And thank thank you. you for everything you people have done. I, my, I, I, and before my, my, my God and Lord, I could not do your job. And I mean that. I'm serious. Mr. Thank Pargans, you so would you like to move your exhibits into the record? Yes, I would. And I do appreciate you asking me that question. Thank Are you there so much. any objections? Not, no? 
I don't have any objections. I am looking at the water board's website. And so I assume that obviously the ones that are struck that we're talking about the five or four exhibits that are listed there that are not struck, right? Correct. All right, accepted into the record. Thank you, Ms. Por Mr. Porgans. But personally, I, I will hope that you win the lottery. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate we that. need to take a break, and I need to let uh, folks know that uh, apparently there's some trouble with the webcasting, and so the AV folks are going to try to fix it during the break. Uh, if you are able to view this, you will likely be kicked off and will need to reopen and uh, reinitiate the webcast, but we're trying to get that fixed. So why don't we take a break until uh, 10.55. I'll ask Mr. Brodsky to have his panels all set up, and when we resume, we'll get to you. Thank you.
right, it's 1055. We are resuming with Mr. Brodsky's Save the California Delta Alliance panel number one. I believe Mr. Brodsky has an opening statement to make of roughly 20 minutes. And then your direct of all your witnesses, you said would be about 40 minutes? 40 minutes. Okay, so we're talking roughly an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. Ms. Ainsley, your cross. I have very limited cross, mainly only um, making sure that I know the data that went into a couple figures. So I think it cannot be more than 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how witness, witnesses answer. And would that be for all witnesses? It, it would. I, well, I, I'll look at my notes again, but at least, yes, I can ask the questions of all witnesses. I, I can look right now and make sure that all witnesses cite the same figures, but all I right. can ask generally who has the information. So we're now at an hour, 30 minutes roughly. Who else needs to cross? Tom Keeling for the San Joaquin County protestants. At most 10 minutes, probably less. And uh, Mr. Reese has uh, 15 minutes, perhaps less. Okay, and then Mr. Jackson. Uh, I'm going to uh, suggest 30 minutes. I think I'll be shorter than that. All right, we are breaking at one o'clock today. So if we do not get through cross-examination and or redirect, recross by one o'clock, then your witnesses will have to come back on Monday. Um, if, um, if I'm the last cross-examiner? Uh, you apparently are not because Ms. Dejardin is lining up behind I'm, you. I'm sorry. Um, I, I will make whatever accommodation I need to make to get people out of here if that's the desire. Um, this is Deirdre Desjardins, and again, I'll make whatever uh, accommodation is required to get people out of here, but um, I'd like to reserve 20 minutes. Well, the accommodation is not for people, but for the hearing officers. We are adjourning at 1 p.m. With that, Mr. Brodsky, please provide your opening statement. Uh, thank you, Michael Brodsky on behalf of Save the California Delta Alliance. And uh, I would like to give the hearing officers a basic overview roadmap of the testimony of our witnesses. And uh, then each witness will, uh, witnesses testimony drills down and gives the detail. If we could have uh, exhibit SCDA 72 on the screen. Can you minimize it a little bit so we can see the whole thing? There you go. And the, um, okay, so this is an overview map of the Delta and the construction activities in the Delta that will result from water fix. The information on this map was drawn from the environmental impact report, from the NMFS biological opinion, and from the biological assessment. The takeaway point is that this is going to be a massive construction zone for 11 years that will deal a death blow to recreation in the Delta. We believe that the drop in recreational boating in the Delta as, as a reaction to all the unpleasant construction activity will result in the closure of 20% or more of the 100 or so Delta marinas. And I'd like to explain uh, a little bit what's on the map. Um, I have a laser pointer here, and perhaps if the projectionist could move the mouse to these areas where I'm pointing, that might make it easy for, for people who are following on the screen. Uh, this is the route of the tunnels. And along that route of the tunnels, every so often, there's an access shaft every few miles. And those access shafts will be used to haul the concrete tunnel liner segments in to be lowered down to the tunnel area, work area, 
and then the m tunnel muck that is excavated in the in the boring of the tunnels will be hauled up out of those shafts. The tunnel liner segments um, will originate in th from three ports, the port of Stockton, the port of Antioch, and the port of San Francisco, and they'll be transported on barges into the delta. These red dashed lines here represent the routes that these barges will take. And so you can see that the barge routes are pretty much just all over the delta. If we could scroll down to the bottom of the page, the amount of tunnel muck that will be excavated is 30 million cubic yards, which is in the EIR, and that's roughly equivalent to two and a half million dump truck loads. Much of the muck will be transported on barges like this, which are described in the biological opinion as being 50 feet by 250 feet. And the muck that is taken up out of these shafts will be hauled to muck dump sites. The two major dump sites are this one here on Bolden Island and this one here um, at Clifton Court 4 Bay. Some will be hauled on trucks, some will be hauled on barges. Um, one of the important things that the environmental impact report missed entirely is that as these barges are traveling on these waterways, for example, where I'm pointing to right here, barges will travel on the Sacramento River to reach uh, an, an unloading facility at intake number two, that will cross under this Rio Vista bridge here. The EIR stated explicitly that they're assuming there'll be no additional openings of drawbridges. That's just false. This Rio Vista bridge will have to be opened every time a barge crosses underneath. This bridge on the McCullamy River will have to be opened every time a barge crosses underneath. There's a bridge here on Highway 4 that will have to be opened every time a barge crosses underneath. We have four round trips a day of barges going to this staging area. So that bridge right there will have to be opened eight times a day. That's gonna cause massive backups on Highway 4 here and on Highway 12 here. In addition, there are eight new barge landings. I'm showing them on the map here. One at North Delta intake number two and then scattered throughout the Delta. Each one of those barge landings will have a five mile per hour zone at it. Also, it will, there'll be dozens of barges operating in the Delta, and in many places they'll be anchored. There'll be a five mile per hour zone there. Also, in the upper right hand corner, this map is from the DHCCP, and each one of these dots is a geotechnical exploration point where they're gonna drill. Many of those are over water, where that line crosses over a liver, river or slough. They're gonna drill a geotechnical exploration over water. There'll be a barge anchored there. So those multiple five up per hour zones are an anathema to water skiers and wakeboarders. Those sports require long stretches of water where you can go fast. And if wakeboarders and water skiers get the picture that quote unquote, the Delta's closed for construction, and there are multiple five, per, five mile per hour zones and they can't practice their sport continuously, they'll just choose to go somewhere else for their day or their weekend or their week of water skiing. If we could, uh, another thing that will happen throughout the Delta, uh, the biological assessment contains pile driving uh, assumptions in one of the index that indicates there'll be 23,000 piles driven, about 10,000 of them at the intakes a bunch of them at Clifton Court 4 Bay and then at the various barge landing sites with over 10 million pile strikes, which is gonna be very, very loud, so there's gonna be unpleasant noise throughout the Delta. If we could go to SCDA 85, please. And here we see the three intakes where the construction schedule and the impacts in the uh, uh, appendix to the BA 
He says the pile driving will take place one summer at this in intake, the next summer at this intake, the next summer at this intake. Our acoustical engineer, Charles Salter, will testify that noise levels on the river will be 91 decibels in front of these intakes from that pile driving, which is as loud as standing right next to an ambulance. This will all be a five mile an hour zone. So boaters are simply just not gonna go by here. They're not gonna go five miles an hour for this four or five mile long stretch listening to 91 dBA pile driving. That is essentially gonna close the river to navigation there. Um, our expert uh, Rune Storzend on Monday will testify that impact pile driving is not necessary. That there are alternative methods, auger cast piles or drilled piles uh, that can be used here that are actually better, faster, and cheaper. We've actually provided a bid for DWR from Malcolm Drilling Company to do that work for them at a reasonable cost. So we're asking as a condition of approval, we don't think the project should be approved at all. We don't like water fix, I think you know that. But if you are gonna approve it, a condition should be no impact pile driving here. Use the auger cast method or some other method. If we could see um, SCDA 70, please. And let's minimize that a little bit. A little bit smaller? A little bit smaller, thank you. So this is a blow up of intake three and intake five. This is the town of Hood here. This is a giant construction yard. The pile driving noise will be here. Pile driving noise will be here. There'll be land-based pile driving here. Land-based pile driving here. Construction equipment coming out of this yard that the EIR estimates at over 90 decibels. And this is just a little tiny, and it's designated as a legacy community, by the way, by the, by the legislature. And for them, for good measure, they decided to put a geotechnical exploration zone right through the middle of the town. This, this community is not gonna survive. This is gonna become a ghost town if we do this. And if we could go to SCDA 73. These are two pictures of Upper Snodgrass Slough and the Meadows Slough Anchorage that uh, Captain Morgan took last summer. He'll testify about this. This is considered the most beautiful and picturesque and sought after anchorage area in the Delta. And if we could scroll down to the bottom of the uh, page there. Where these photographs are taken is right in this area right here. And they're proposing a barge landing here, a muck dump here, a concrete batch plant here, a fuel station, a conveyor belt to carry muck over to another muck dump here. And this is just simply gonna ruin this area. So there's no reason why these facilities have to be right here. Again, we're against water fix, but if you're gonna do it, don't put this here. Put this somewhere over by Highway 5 or, or here or somewhere away from the Meadow Slough. Then finally, if we could see SCDA 104, and minimize that a little bit. This is a muck dump on Bolden Island. I, we estimate that at about 10 million cubic yards of muck there. Uh, this is Highway 12, and they're building a new clover leaf here and then a new road to reach the muck bunk dump and the concrete batch plant. There's a barge landing here. Again, this is one of the two major staging areas. They say they'll have four round trip barge trips a day here to deliver the tunnel liners. This Highway 12 is already very heavily impacted. It's a major gateway to reach the Delta and you're gonna have a lot of additional construction trucks on this road here. And then you're gonna additionally have the barges going up the McCullamy River to reach the meadows. So this drawbridge is gonna be opening, backing up traffic. And then if we could go back to SCDA 72, this is that road here we just looked at. Here's the muck dump. You also have the barges going under the Rio Vista Bridge. So that bridge is gonna be opening. 
this bridge is going to be opening. You're going to have massive additional truck traffic and worker traffic on there. This Highway 12 is going to become gridlocked. And so if you're a person that has a choice where to take your trailer boat for the day or for the week, and you come here and you get backed up for a couple hours on some time when you're going there, next time you're going to go to Clear Lake or you're going to go to the bay or you're going to go to Lake Tahoe. You're not going to come to the Delta. And so just the overall cumulative effect of this is that a lot of people who recreate in the Delta are just going to abandon it. They're going to go somewhere else. And so we need this muck dump taken away from here and put over on the other side of Highway 5. We need this facilities at Meadow Slough taken and put somewhere else. We need a condition that says no impact pile driving. We've given you an alternative method. We need a, a condition that says that. And we need to at least think about, if we're going to do this, we need to think about what the impacts on recreation are going to be. And DWR has not been done that at all. Our preference is, and Doug Obeji testified, recycling, conservation, toilet to tap, stormwater capture. The public interest says that these recreational impacts are so severe on the Delta, this thing should not be built. If Met needs water, let them get it from these other sources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brodsky. If I might ask your witnesses to come up and to remain standing with their right hands up, and I will administer the oath. Raise your right hands, please. Ah. <laughs> Other duties of the attorney. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth? Thank you. Please be seated. And Mr. Brodsky, please begin with your direct. And uh, if you could, I'm sorry, if you could uh, move the name tag so that the court reporter can see them. Mr. Wells, could you give us a one or two minute uh, summary of your qualifications and experience in the Delta? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Brodsky. Um, I'm Bill Wells. I moved to California with my parents in 1947, and I've spent most of my life in Sacramento, except for a few years in the Navy and living in Hawaii. Um, I grew up with water issues. My father was a civil engineer and water consultant. Uh, we've discussed water situations at breakfast and dinner every day. Um, I worked for IBM for 25 years, and after that I became a yacht broker in the California Delta for several years, and I've retired from that. Currently, I'm the executive director of the California Delta Chambers and Visitors Bureau, and we support small businesses and tourism in the area. I'm past Commodore and current Delta Port Captain of the Northern California Fleet of the Classic Yacht Association. I'm also an honorary member of the Marina West and Sacramento Yacht Clubs, and Stockton Yacht Club just made me an honorary member, too. Uh, my wife and I cruise our uh, 1937 model uh, Stevens uh, cabin cruiser around the Delta to various uh, adventures. And I write about this in my uh, del uh, monthly Delta Rat scrapbook uh, column in Bay and Delta Yachtsman magazine. I've been active in the fight to preserve and protect the California Delta. I served for two plus years on the Bay Delta Conservation Plan public meeting panel. Um, I served for two years on the Delta Protection Commission Advisory Committee. And I'm a frequent contributor to area publications. I'm a guest speaker at events uh, regarding Delta recreation and water issues. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wells. And could we have uh, SCDA 72 again? And uh, Mr. Wells, have you reviewed the environmental impact report, biological opinion, and biological assessment? Yes, I have. And have you uh, collaborated on the production of this document and verified that the information here is an accurate representation of what's in the EIR uh, uh, BIOP and BA? 
Yes, I agree. It's uh, very accurate. Okay. And could you uh, give us your opinion on what the impacts of the construction measures shown on this map are going to be on Delta Recreation? Yes. Uh, the Delta cannot survive the California water fix. Uh, the Department of Water Resources showed no concern or Ms. awareness. Well, you don't need to rush. You can slow down. Okay. <laughs> awareness of the Delta as a recreational resource and place where people live and work. Much of the project is shaped by requirements imposed by the federal fish agencies, such as the location of the facilities and the concentration of in-water work to the summer and fall months. This may protect the fish, but who will protect the people? The fish agencies have fixed the construction season from June 1 to October 31st, shifting all the heavy construction to the summer months. It puts it in direct conflict with the boating season in the Delta. For those of us in the recreation industry, 90% of the business is done in the summer season between May and October, just when the barges will be clogging our sloughs and the pile drivers will be hammering, hammering away at our sanity. To us here in the Delta, the California water fix is massive amounts of barge traffic, massive amounts of pile driving from giant pile driving rigs, massive amounts of traffic on two-lane Delta roadways, increases in car trips on formerly lonely roads, massive influxes of construction workers, massive amounts of tunnel muck dumped on Delta Islands, and a massive negative impact on Delta recreation and those who make our living in the recreation industry in the Delta. These massive impacts are not disputed. It's a quote from the EIR. The multi-year schedule and geographic scale of the project-related construction activities and anticipated incremental decline, decline in recreational spending would be cumulatively considerable, unquote. Nor is it disputed that many of us here in the Delta will not survive the water fix economically. Another quote from the EIR, recreation dependent businesses, including marinas and recreational supply retailers, may not be able to economically weather the effects of multi-year construction activities and may be forced to close as a result, unquote. In my opinion, 20% of the Delta marinas will be forced out of business by water fix. I do not think that DWR will disagree with this estimate, but DWR has done nothing to protect Delta recreation. They've insisted on locating massive tunnel dump, muck dumps on Delta Islands. These dumps could be relocated outside the Delta to su suitable dumping grounds. They've insisted on locating three massive intake structures right next to the small legacy communities of Clarksburg and Hood, and also the little town of Locke. There's no hydrological rationale or engineering necessity for picking this location. It happened to be convenient for DWR and our, and our legacy communities dwarfed by the adjacent massive construction works must be destroyed as a result. They insisted on locating their largest staging facility and muck dump on Bolden Island off Highway 12 near two drawbridges that will be prone open by constant construction barge traffic, creating the worst traffic nightmare imaginable on the main recreational gateway to the Delta. There's no reason why this facility has to be located here. The dump should be outside the Delta. This is a $17 billion project. If DWR has to put major construction staging area along the tunnel route, they can pick a spot where the tunnels pass closer to Highway 5 and build a dedicated access road to the site. We should not suffer a million or more dump truck runs on our already overworked two-lane Highway 12. Doug Obese has made the case that alternative water supply methods are available. The Delta Reform Act instructs all of us, including the state water's resources. Sure. Ms. Ainsley? Yes, I don't believe that uh, Mr. Obiji's testimony was referred to in Mr. Wells' testimony, so I believe this is getting off the track of his direct testimony. That, that, that is correct. The original reference was to Professor Brent Haddad, who we withdrew as a witness. Professor Haddad's testimony is very similar to Mr. Obeji's testimony. That's one of the reasons we withdrew it, because it was duplicative. He also had to be in Europe at this time. And so I think Mr. Wells uh, has reviewed uh, uh, Mr. Obeji's testimony, and his reference to it is just generally that there are desalination, recycling, conservation available. 
It's and a passing reference. And he's not going into further detail. No further detail. And I would move to strike any references to Mr. OBG's testimony. That's proper on rebuttal when you address people's cases in chief, but it's not proper to provide support to another protestant's testimony in the same, in, in phase two. So this is not well, testimony that's in his direct. It, it certainly his witness, they are able to bring a rebuttal to Mr. OBG's case in chief or NRDC's case in chief, but it is not proper to substitute now Mr. Hadid's, a reference to Mr. Hadid's testimony, Hadad, excuse me, that has been withdrawn with a reference now to Mr. Obiji's testimony is surprise testimony then. Mr. Well, Brodsky. Mr. Wells' testimony is essentially that water recycling, conservation, et cetera, are available. Hold on, hold on. Is it actually in his written testimony? That he speaks of conservation? I believe so, other measures. All right, then in that case, then I don't see what relevance is the, the reference to Mr. Obiji's testimony if it is already in what, Mr. What, Wells' what page, testimony. What, what page is that? Page two of mine. The, the reference to Mr. Haddad's testimony is- It says right here. Page 18. L let me read it. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> the reference to Mr. Obiji's testimony is not needed because the substance of it is already in Mr. Wells' testimony. Is that my understanding? Is that correct? Uh, it is my understanding that he does not talk about those topics. Well, what his testimony says is the policy of this, and not quoting Haddad, the policy of the state of California is to reduce reliance on the Delta and meeting California's future water supply needs through a statewide strategy of investing in improved regional supplies, conservation, and water use e efficiency. And so. So let's stick with that testimony. Okay, let's do that. All right, Mr. Ms. Ainsley, your objection is sustained. Okay, um, well, the Delta Reform Act instruct, uh, instructs us all, including the State Water Resources Control Board, that quote, the policy of the state of California is to reduce reliance on the Delta in meeting California's future water supply needs through a statewide strategy of investing in improved regional supplies, conservation and water use efficiency, unquote. That's really the end of the matter. Uh, water fix is highly destructive to the Delta and there's uh, several alternatives that would uh, have a better plan and lower cost and preserve the Delta for future generations. Thank you very much. May I ask a question on direct? Mr. Wells, is it your opinion that instead of exporting water for, from the Delta that Southern California water supply needs can be met through conservation uh, recycling and other alternative supply measures. Right, I agree with that. Uh, throw in desalination, uh, there are breakthroughs every year in uh, desalination technology, so uh, the, 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 you can't keep taking water out of the Delta forever, so they need to come up with a plan to, to supply Southern California uh, on their own. I, I don't believe he discusses Southern California. I think it's improper to cross your own witness. I think that, that we've heard Mr. Wells' testimony, we have it here in front of us, there, there's no need to ask a, a further question on, uh, in essentially a cross of your own witness. So I'm, I'm happy to be pointed out where he talks about Southern California and conservation projects. Is that mentioned in your <laughs> written testimony, Mr. Wells? Yes, I believe it is. Let me, uh, let me rephrase the question, Bill. Yes. Let me just rephrase the question. Is your, your opinion that the future water supply needs of the state of California can be met by reducing reliance on the Delta through implementing desalination, water conservation, and other alternative water supply measures? Yes. Thank you. And is he withdrawing the earlier question and testimony? That is my understanding. Yes. Okay. I believe that Mr. Wells is done and you yes. can now move on to your next witness. So our next witness is uh, gonna be Mr. Kinzel. And uh, could Mr. Kinzel, could you give us a brief uh, overview of your uh, qualifications? Good morning, I'm Chris Kinzel. I'm a, a professional traffic engineer. 
I uh, am a graduate of uh, the University of California and Fresno State University. I've been practicing traffic engineering for more than 50 years. I am a, a registered civil engineer and a registered traffic engineer in the state of California. I've been involved with uh, numerous uh, traffic studies, environmental impact reports, and other documents. And uh, would you like to have any exhibits on the screen while you talk? Uh, uh, 72, SCDA 72, please, to start with. And have you had the opportunity to uh, review the traffic analysis in the California Water Fix uh, EIR? Yes, I have. And um, ha have you collaborated in the, in the production of this exhibit? Uh, by reviewing uh, the uh, California Water Fix uh, traffic section in the EIR? Yes, I have. And also the uh, section of the uh, biological opinion from NMFS that uh, prescribes the barge routes? Yes. And of your own personal knowledge, is the information represented on this map accurate? Yes, it is. And could you give us a, a, your opinion, if any, about the impacts on traffic of the California Water Fix project? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, the, um, as, as was noted earlier, the, the map shows the, uh, all the details which uh, Mr. Brodsky went through, the, in the location of the uh, project itself, the, uh, the routes where the, <coughs> where the um, uh, barges will take, the, uh, the dumping sites, and, and that sort of thing. So the first thing that struck me about this project as a traffic engineer was how massive it is, how big it is. Uh, and from a traffic standpoint, there are two separate uh, main parts to the uh, project. First is, is boring the tunnels and hauling away the excavated uh, tunnel uh, material, in this case, muck. And there are, with 40 miles of uh, tunnels and f each 40 feet in diameter, there's just a lot of muck. Um, muck will be dumped permanently and left in place at uh, uh, two main sites, the Bolden Island, the Olulu Plain, okay, the Bolden Island location and down at Clifton Four Bay and then at a few other locations to the, to the north. Uh, the muck is gonna be carried on large barges, H1, uh, uh, about almost as, big, as long as a, as a football field. Could, could we and scroll down to the bottom to see a picture of a barge? Thank you. Those are the barges, and uh, they are, as you can see, they're pushed um, uh, by a tugboat, and uh, then in, the other conveyance are the dump trucks shown on, on the left. Um, the documents indicate that there be about 9,400 uh, barge loads during the life of the project, a lot of barges. Um, the barges load or unload at the barge landings that will be constructed along the river. Uh, there's about seven of them, so they're about, on average, six miles apart. And so there's a lot of uh, dump truck acti activity and barges moving up and down, carrying muck to the muck dumps. Um, the second part of the project from a traffic significant standpoint is hauling the tunnel liners uh, to the various sections of the tunnels uh, from where they're manufactured in, in uh, San Francisco, Antioch, or Stockton. Uh, the tunnel liners will be barged uh, initially to those two main uh, sites, which are also the muck dumps at Clifton Court. Uh, Four Bay and Bolden Island, and they're going to be from that point. They'll be distributed to other locations. About 5,500 uh, barge trips. So this is um, that combination is where the traffic problems appear. Um, the Bolden Island location is uh, in a central location and is one of the two largest. Uh, so there's thousands of uh, barge and truck drums we're, we're going to be focused at that location. And also, that's where the 
the large tunnel liners are going to be uh, sent to for future distribution up and down the uh, tunnel. Uh, barges coming from San Francisco will uh, need to go uh, that are delivering tunnel liners, for example, up to the intake area, will have to use the Rio Vista Bridge um, of the Sacramento River. Uh, the Rio Vista Bridge is, uh, carries high, Highway 12, State Route 12, and that highway has more than 20,000 cars a day. It's over capacity. It's defined as being over capacity. Of those 20,000 vehicles a day, about 3,000 of those are trucks, and uh, most of those trucks are uh, five-axle big rig. That's an important cross-connector highway. Um, so there's heavy amounts of uh, existing volumes, and the EIR says uh, no problem at the Rio Vista Bridge because it's a high-level bridge, but it's not. It's a drawbridge, and it opens a lot uh, during the day, and every time it opens, traffic backs up um, for some distance, and the, the town city of Rio Vista is just inundated with traffic from existing conditions. Uh, when when that road opens and uh, that bridge opens, it takes about 25 minutes for uh, a barge to get through it. So the highway uh, congestion created by this bridge is already a problem without the increased barge traffic. Uh, if I could have the um, 104, thank you. This shows the Bolton Island uh, location, and, and here in the, in, is Highway 12, and here's the, here's the muck dump and the location where the uh, supplies and so on will come up, including all the tunnel liners. So they have to come to this point, and again, the Rio Vista Bridge is off to the, uh, the left here, about five miles away, and the, the McCallamy River Bridge is at this point. All the traffic then, uh, going in and out of this location from the east uh, uses the McCallamy Bridge as well as the Rio Vista Bridge. Uh, that bridge is uh, frequently opened, and when it opens, uh, traffic backs up for at least half a mile under normal road conditions and longer under during peak periods. The uh, traffic... Uh, uh, hauling in the uh, tunnel liners, um, which will come in through the through this location, uh, and then from there they'll be hauled out by trucks to the various location. So that means that uh, that bridge will be opened frequently uh, to handle the barges, and it's be handling these many uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of additional vehicles over time, trucks, handling these uh, large tunnel liners. So the EIR states not only about the Rio Vista Bridge, but by the other bridges, uh, McCallany and down on Highway 4, that none of these draw bridges need to be open. Um, and they didn't even look at the issues associated with that, either current or, and especially in the future ones. This is a major flaw. So from a traffic engineering standpoint, a lot of the people that are u using the Delta are uh, people who live in the Bay Area, live in the Sacramento area, live throughout, and uh, they're dealing with congestion all the time. Now, uh, why would they come to a super congested roadway corridor uh, in the Delta um, voluntarily to to recreate. Uh, I think this will this will be a, a major uh, impetus to cause people to find other locations. I'd like to also mention the, uh, the traffic in the along Highway 160 in the Hood, Clarksburg, and Lock Lark area, Lock area. The, um, Maybe we could see a CDA 85. 
These are, these are relatively uh, quiet and historic towns, and we've heard about the, the desirability of uh, these areas as, as recreational facilities. This area is going to be simply overrun uh, continuously. There's, there's thousands, literally thousands of workers in this area that will be driving up and down the roads along with the trucks, along with the uh, area uh, handling all these workers. So again, from a, from a traffic standpoint, this is totally unacceptable as a, somebody who's coming to the Delta to, to recreate. So EIRs that talk about impacts always talk about mitigation measures. And I think you can tell uh, that this EIR really overlicked and downplayed the major traffic impacts that I've just talked about just by listening to the titles of the mitigation measures. The first one was implement site-specific construction traffic management plan, as though that would make a difference. The second one is limit hours or amount of construction activity on congested roadway segments. Uh, the hours that would have to be limited to practically zero to, to uh, solve these problems. And then make good faith efforts to enter into mitigation agreements to enhance capacity of uh, congested roadway segments. So these, these measures, I believe, would have little effect on the traffic congestion uh, produced by this project as it now stands. I'll be happy to respond to questions. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Kinzel, this uh, SCDA uh, 100 is your written testimony, is that correct? Yes. And this is a true and accurate representation of your written testimony? Yes. And this, in here, there are a number of footnotes where you say that various exhibits are true and correct copies. And is that correct that you verified that all those exhibits listed in the footnotes are true and correct copies? Yes, I have. And to the extent those exhibits represent information in the EIR, biological opinion, biological assessment, they do so accurately? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, next I'd uh, like to ask Mr. Frank Morgan uh, to uh, uh, give a brief statement of his qualifications. Good morning. My name is Frank Morgan. I've lived in a waterfront home in Discovery Bay for the last 18 years. I have been boating consistently in the Delta for 40 years. Uh, in 2012, my wife and I started a, a cruise business, a charter cruise business called Captain Morgan's Delta Adventures out of Discovery Bay. I'm a US Coast Guard certified or credentialed captain with a 100 ton uh, captain's license. Our business uh, has grown from about 12 cruises in 2012 to um, 135 cruises in 2015. As a result of that success, uh, in 2017, we were honored with uh, Small Business of the Year by Assemblyman Jim Frazier's office uh, representing the uh, 11th uh, state's 11th district. Um, on our tours, guests enjoy uh, vistas and scenic tours of the Delta, along with land excursions throughout the Delta region. Examples of those excursions are we take people on the water up the river and stop at a, at a port or a marina, and we take them into Sassoon City to the electric uh, train museum to visit that. We also go to um, the only uh, operational, original um, Japanese bathhouse, which is located in um, Walnut Grove. And of course, we stop at Locke and the many museums there to explore and, and learn about the history of the Japanese and how they built the levee system we all enjoy today. Through my years of cruising on the Delta, I gained a deep um, and thorough understanding of uh, the Delta and uh, Delta Recreation. I fully understand um, and have observed firsthand uh, the negative effects disruptive events have on the Delta, like the blue-green algae or the water hyacinth or drought conditions. So with that, that kind of summarizes my qualifications and I'd be happy to summarize my testimony. Maybe I'll just uh, ask a couple of questions first. So uh, Mr. Morgan, SCDA 86 is your written testimony? 
Yes. And that's an accurate and correct copy of your testimony? Yes, it is. And you cite several exhibits in the footnotes uh, that you say are true and correct copies, and, and that is correct, those are true and correct copies? Yes. And to the extent those exhibits represent materials in the biological opinion, biological assessment, and EIR, they do so accurately? Yes. Thank you. And could you uh, give us your opinion, if any, on the effects of the water fix project? Sure. Um, if we could uh, have uh, uh, SCDA 72 back up, please. You know, as Mr. Brodsky already stated, but I will reiterate that, uh, you know, there we have multiple new bridge landings all the way through the heart of the Delta. Um, with all of those uh, new uh, barge landings, I should say, all of those barge landings come with five mile an hour zones for boaters. Um, there will be at least 9,400 barge trips hauling tunnel liner segments in and muck um, out. Dozens of barges all over the Delta, whether they're running and moving up and down the Delta or whether they're anchored, they're going to represent a five mile an hour zone around those uh, anchored barges as well. In addition to the 9,400 barge trips, <clears throat> you have other on water geological drilling activities going on throughout the Delta, which will also be five mile an hour zones. The in-water construction activity is concentrated in the summer months, which is the prime boating season. About 90% of all the boating on the Delta is done during the summer months and during this construction period, the proposed first. Hold on, please, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Yeah, Sling. my objection is that none of this is in his testimony. I do see that Mr. Morgan does reference SCDA uh, 72, so I could understand how he might repeat the facts here on SDCDA 72, but we're already going far afield then from what is written on his testimony, which is all of basically a page long. So I would really prefer not to <clears throat> go beyond, I, I, I understand from his testimony earlier that he may have verified the accuracy of this figure himself, but, and I will have questions on that, but I do think that he has now gone well beyond what is written in his testimony. I believe it was Mr. Wales <coughs> who confirmed that earlier. Well, both have confirmed. Oh, so Mr. Okay. Mr. Morgan in on page one says SCDA 72 is a true and correct copy and accurate overview depiction of construction activity. And so he is summarizing that overview. He also says that he has, he agrees with his colleague Bill Wells' conclusions in his written testimony, and so he is explaining, is summarizing his agreement with Mr. Wells' conclusions, and summarizing, explaining how this is an accurate overview of the construction activity, and there's nothing else, he's not saying anything outside of that, and. He's adding facts and details outside of that, which is her objection. It is my objection that that would be additional. I, I am fully capable, obviously, of reading Mr. Wells' testimony, and I'm aware of the content of that. What I'm objecting to is Mr. Morgan now adding testimony that's either duplicative, but really a surprise testimony that I was not aware he was going to start presenting. Ms. Dane. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, Mr. Morgan, you say that in your testimony you think Bill's estimate of 20% failure rate for Delta Marinas due to water for fix impacts is, is a low figure, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you say that you run your charter boat up to the Clarksburg Hood Lock Meadows area, and this is one of the most scenic and peaceful areas of the Delta, is that correct? Yes. And then uh, on page one of your testimony at line 17, uh, you quote from uh, Mr. Halshell's book about the Delta and uh, have a conclusion. Could you read that portion of your testimony from line 17 that starts Halshell to the end of that paragraph? Yes. Halshell described the meadows in his famous book. Quote, you feel a man could go in there and never be found, unquote. The meadows is the most 
popular Delta Anchorage, if uh, the Meadows is the most popular Delta Anchorage, quote, if popularity awards were given for Delta Anchorages, the Meadows would win hands down, unquote. And then, Go ahead. yet DWR ch chose to lo uh, this location as a major barge route, muck dump, and construction staging area complete with concrete batch plant and fuel station. The construction impacts will occur and be severe all over the Delta. The impacts uh, on the small towns of Hood, Clarksburg, and Locke will devastate these communities. Recreation on the river will come to a halt and the location of the intakes for miles above the intakes and for miles below the intakes. It is obvious to me that these communities and recreate, uh, uh, it is obvious to me that these communities and recreation on the river cannot survive construction of these intakes at this location. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morgan. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Mr. Russell Ohms. And uh, Mr. Ohms, could you give us a brief statement of your qualifications? I don't think it's on. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Uh, thank you for providing a forum in our shared participatory democracy. Uh, my name is Russell Ohms. Uh, I live in the town of Locke, and I've lived there for about 45 years. I bought a building there in 1975, and I've been associated with the town and the area ever since. Um, I am the current chairman of the Lock Management Association, and what that does is it runs the town, but most importantly, we're concerned with the historic part of the town and, and keeping it uh, as it was. Um, we also manage the town and take care of the roads, things like that. Uh, and in my role as a lock management director, I have become very familiar with the Lock National Historic District. So we're on the National Register of Historic Places, like the state capitol is on that list. There's a hundred of them in Sacramento County. And uh, we, the town, is the largest intact, um, complete example of a rural agricultural Chinese American community in the United States. It's the only one, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, most Chinatowns were part of a city, so it was San Francisco Chinatown. But this was an amazing, independent little town. Um, so I really understand the unique uh, sense of place and historical identity of the community. Um, it's just a, a very fragile community. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping today to, to communicate what that town is about and uh, uh, to understand that the impacts this project will have on the town, uh, in my opinion. Um, I'm witnessing that I've uh, entered into a kind of a, a legal cage so fight. Let's uh, stop let here then, then. and uh, thank you for your qualification. Well, let me and let's go next to your, uh, a, let me ask you, is SCDA 130 uh, an accurate copy of your written testimony? Yes. And could you just give us a summary of what you're saying in SCDA 130? And if you'd like to have any exhibits on the screen uh, while you're doing that, let us know what they are. Okay, would you like to put up uh, 85, number 85? It's the whole area uh, from uh, Clarksburg on down to Locke. And perhaps if we could just, I'm sorry to interrupt, if we could minimize that a little bit so we could see the whole thing. It's, it's a long exhibit. There, there we go. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. And to go on with my familiarity with the area is that I used to be a member of the Community Development Block Grants, and so I've worked closely with the towns of Hood, Cortland, and uh, Walnut Grove, and that's, and also I was on the DECMAC, uh, Delta Citizens Municipal Advisory Committee, and that was for Walnut Grove. So I know these people. I, I'm in the community. I'm, I'm part of Rotary, so I, I live there, let's just say, so I am uh, talk. Uh, this project will devastate Locke. It'll devastate all the small communities along the Sacramento River, uh, starting with Hood, up top, is that number 70? Uh, Michael, would you put, is that 70? 
Let's uh, have Exhibit 70, please, SCA 70. Yeah. Thank you. And there you can see uh, how small the community that actually is. You see the little, in the middle hood, that's the size of the town, and you can see the construction around it is huge. Um, it's, I don't think there's two, 300 people in hood, and if you can see the size of the construction around it, it'll be totally destroyed. There, there's no way that, that that town will survive. But I can mostly speak for Locke, and I don't know how to communicate the quality of living in Locke. Uh, it's just been, a, it's an amazing place to be. And when people come from outside, because people come from all over the world to come to Locke, and they come to see the history in Locke. And they're, uh, they're, they're guided there by history books and things like that. And we're, we're a close community. We have community gardens in the back. Uh, it's a... Uh, we raise chickens, we raise bees, we eat together, we talk together, we fix the roads together. Uh, all that will be destroyed by the construction of this tunnel. Um, the, the main street on River Road, the houses are 40 feet from the road. Uh, uh, even now, we cannot leave the town because some uh, driving app put the commuter traffic from Highway 12 through Lock. They're coming up Highway 160. And we have, I think, 7,000 cars a day come through now. Uh, when I first moved there, you could fall asleep on the street at night. There were no one went by. It was that quiet. So um, there's no Dr. question. Hold on, please. Ms. Pardon. Ainsley? Yes, I mean, I understand that we're a little bit off our testimony, and I, I don't have a huge problem. I did have a problem when we strayed into the number of cars going through lock. Oh. I don't believe that's in the testimony. I, it's not. 7,000 cars. I, I do believe I have a problem with, with facts, but I'm trying to be judicious in my sure. objections. For the All record, right. since I'm standing here, I will also note that Mr. O and I will not move to strike his testimony on the qualifications, but I will note that the link to his qualifications on the board's website is actually a duplicate copy of his testimony. Huh. Yes, that, that is correct. And I did submit, and that was my error. I did submit yesterday a notice of errata stating that I discovered yesterday that when I uploaded these documents back in November, instead of uploading his qualifications in his testimony, I accidentally uploaded two copies of his testimony. Um, I say in my email to the board yesterday that his qualifications were prepared and were ready in November, but that I simply made a mistake, me personally made a mistake and didn't upload them. I did upload the, the qualifications yesterday as a notice of errata and requested that the board excuse my error. I, I don't believe I saw those on the service list, but I'm happy to go check that. All right. We did have some server issues yesterday. All right. Please continue. I don't know what to say. Uh, you can, uh, I agree that you can't cite facts and figures. You can simply speak of your experience of Locke, as you say in your written testimony, as a quiet historic place, and what effects this will have in general terms on the quiet historic nature of your community. Well, it will take away any enjoyment of the town. The noise will be horrific. Uh, I can't make a quote. Um, there will be trucks going by. Uh, I won't give you a number I read. Um, and it will be noisy. And uh, right now, I can feel the pair trucks when they go by uh, during the season. It, I'm th 300 feet from the road, and it, it shakes my house. Um, uh, the, as I say, I cannot leave the town now. Uh, I don't know what, how we will survive. A a the buildings are fragile. Uh, it's 100-year-old wooden structures. Um, I don't know how we will survive okay. if this is approved. Let me ask you if you could turn to page one of your testimony and uh, just read the third paragraph down that starts Clark, Clarksburg Hood and Walnut Grove. Clarksburg Hood, Walnut Grove. In a Grove. good, uh, entertaining reading voice so we don't fall asleep. I will try. Clarksburg Hood, Walnut Grove, and Locke are all set in a historic landscape that is pretty much as it was when Locke was built in the early 20th century. Our cultural institutions and gathering places haven't changed much since then. The EIR discloses that construction activities associated with water conveyance facilities 
would be anticipated to result in changes to the rural qualities of these communities, uh, legacy communities of Clarksburg Hood, Walnut Grove, during the construction period and could also result in changes to community cohesion if they were to restrict mobility, reduce opportunities for maintaining face-to-face -face relationships, or disrupt the functions of community organizations or community gathering places. Under alternative 4A, several gathering places that lie in the vicinity of construction areas could be indirectly affected by noise and traffic associated with construction activities. Uh, EIR, I guess, 16-279, the area of the construction site for intakes two, three, and five, as well as the intermediate four bay and the muck piles where the tunnel muck will be dumped are much larger than the area of our communities. The construction activities will be ongoing for a decade or more and thousands of construction workers will flood the area. Okay, In my opinion, Mr. the entire- uh, Mr. Holmes, if you could turn uh, now to, to page two at line 20. Okay, the historic district exists. And then exists. start with that uh, sentence, the, the historic district and read to the end of that paragraph. The historic district exists in the context of the largely unaltered late 19th century landscape surrounding it. It is, uh, it is now, for the most part, as it was when the immigrants first settled here. The industrial forebay, as well as the tunnel muck dumping sites, are in very close proximity to the town of Block. There are historic homes on the banks of the Sacramento River close to the intakes. Perhaps the only remaining example of a levee side historic farmhouse is near one of the intakes. The nearby town of Hood is an iconic example of the Delta as place. The intake facilities changed the character of the entire area and presented an unavoidable adverse effect on the historic values of the area. And then can I ask you, uh, Mr. Holmes, in your opinion, from your experience living in this area for a while, for many years and being familiar with it. Do you believe that these this intakes and all this major construction av activity simply need to be located someplace else if Locke is to survive? I believe that, yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and this, thank you. Uh, let me just ask you that SCDA 130 is a true and correct copy of your uh, written testimony? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think that concludes our direct uh, presentation. All right. Well, let me, oh, I'm sorry. Let me just go back to Mr. Wells. I forgot to ask Mr. Wells uh, the same question. Yes. Um, SCDA 150 is a true and correct copy of your written testimony? Yes, it is. And there are a number of exhibits that you reference in footnotes that you say are true and correct copies of those exhibits. Is that true? Those are true and correct copies? Yes, that is true. And to the extent those exhibits represent information in the EIR, biological opinion and biological assessment, it's of your own personal knowledge that they do so accurately? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Candace, are you doing okay? Need a few minutes to get up and just stretch? You good? Okay. Thank you. And we will, before Ms. Ainsley begins. Mr. Jackson, I have a quick housekeeping matter, just in case we get pressed for time up at the one o'clock time period. Go ahead, Mr. Jackson. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have, my witnesses are on on Tuesday, yes. uh, including Dr. Ed Whitelaw. Um, DWR has uh, graciously offered to allow his testimony to go in to evidence without the need for him to fly uh, from Portland. Um, if that's a, acceptable with the um, uh, with the hearing officers. It uh, is indeed. We do wish Dr. Whitelaw well. Thank you very much. And it, we're doing so under the understanding that we will be foregoing our cross of Dr. Whitelaw and that we understand that Mr. Jackson has polled the attorneys in the audience and that they do not themselves also have uh, cross-examination for Dr. Whitelaw. So yes, we, we are agreeing to stipulate to his testimony coming in under the understanding that there is no cross-examination for Mr. or for Dr. Whitelaw. All right. Okay. Thank you.
Good morning. My name is Julianne Ainsley. I'm with the Department of Water Resources. I can't quite see all of your names. I know you're turning them for the, the <laughs> but I will do my best. It, she, she needs to see them as well. So uh, I think I got it now. Yeah, I think I got it. <clears throat> and most of my questions, I, I have a couple questions regarding some missing sites that are in a couple people's testimony and then regarding the figures that you all used in your presentations. So um, <clears throat> if we could call up SC, well, let me first ask, I, I believe Mr. Wells, you and maybe Mr. Morgan uh, refer to SCDA 67 through 69, which are, I believe, labeled as intake noise maps on the Save the California Delta Alliance. Do yeah. you know which three exhibits I'm referencing? Yes. It, and this is just a general question to save time. We can break it down. It, is it your understanding, were those maps created by Mr. Salter, who is another witness, or were they created by anyone sitting here today? Uh, well, it was a collaborative effort among uh, all of us. Mr. Salter, I believe, just gave the uh, noise figures. <laughs> can we look at SCDA uh, 67 real fast, just to make sure? Yes. And this was a collaborative effort between whom? Uh, Mr. Brodsky, myself, Mr. Morgan, and Mr. Salter. Mr. Salter provided all the uh, information on the noise data. And what part did you provide? Uh, well, just the map area. You, you provided the base map that was used? Uh, well, I didn't provide it, but I agreed that it was uh, accurate. And how did you verify its accuracy? Uh, comparing it with uh, uh, the uh, water fix documents. And who placed the locations on this map of uh, intake two or the foundation structure? Who placed the labels on this map? Uh, Mr. Brodsky, I believe. And did you verify the accuracy of those locations? Yes. Can we look at the next map? I'm sorry, which would be SCDA 68. Is your answer the same for this figure? Yes. And is it your testimony that the locations were provided by Mr. Brodsky, but verified by you? Yes. And the noise data was provided by Mr. Salter, for whom I can ask questions on Monday. Is that correct? But Mr. The noise numbers are provided by, or any testimony regarding noise would have been provided by Mr. Salter? Yes. Okay. And can we look at the, the, the last one, which is SCDA 69? And again, this was a collaborative effort between you, Mr. Brodsky, and Mr. Salter. Yes. And the base map was provided by Mr. Brodsky? Uh, yeah, using, again, um, water fix documents. Do you know which water fix documents these base maps come from? I believe. Yeah, all these from uh, figure M15-4, recreation facilities, modified pipeline tunnel alignment, alternative four. And is that, am I correct in thinking, is that SCDA 104? Can we look at SCDA 104, please? Just to make sure. Are you, and can we scroll down to the bottom? Is this M15-4, is this the map you were uh, referencing? Yes, yes. And so it is your understanding that the locations on SCDA 69 were taken from this figure M15-4? Uh, not that page, there's several pages, or six pages. If I may, M15-4 sure. is the DWR um, uh, general map, and it has um, multiple sheets. It's, uh, M, it should be M15-4 index, and its sheet that we're looking at is one of eight. Um, what you have up there on the screen there is sheet four of eight. 
Okay. So I think you want Correct, yeah. So Mr. Wanted. Wells, let me do a final clarifying question then. So is your understanding that the locations and facilities that were uh, placed on SCDA, and I'll put it all together, but we can break it down if you like, 67 through 69 came from figures M15-4, sheets one through eight. Yes. Alternative four. Yes. Okay. And they were created just to make sure, not to do an accident answer, but to make sure that I can just move on. These were created collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with you, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Brodsky, and Mr. Salter. Yes. Okay, thank you. Can we call up SCDA 70, please? And and I will I will be again asking Mr. Wells, but it's only because I know these were referenced in his testimony. I'm not trying to preclude Mr. Morgan or anyone else from answering this question. Um, this looks to me like it was created on, um, these do not look like colors from the DWR maps. This looks to me like it was created by uh, another system, another GIS system possibly. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, quite possibly. Do you know who placed the footprints of the intakes here on SCDA 70? Uh, well, I think, that if I'm not mistaken, they came from the document we just referenced. Okay, and so it's your understanding that SCDA 70 uh, also came from F the map book for M15-4, sheets one through eight? Yes. And, and is it your understanding that, that the information came from map sheets M15-4 potentially, but that somebody created this figure anew? Uh, well, this, I believe, is a, from a Google map, actually, probably copied up from that. Okay, and and how was the information pulled from map sheets M15-4? Well, let, let me try it. Hopefully, I can clarify it. <laughs> um, what we did is used DWR's map, this M15-4, alternative 4, and sheets um, 1 through 8 as the basis to create the other exhibits that you are referring to, like SCDA 67 through this SCDA 70. They were created by Mr. Brodsky, as the drawing there shows, and collaborated some of it. For example, um, there's pictures in here um, on one of our uh, exhibits that I provided and so forth and Mr. Wells contributed as well. Um, but these are direct uh, representations of what is in the DWR M15 uh, index four. I guess my a clarifying question for you, Mr. Morgan, is were these, did you have electronic versions of M15-4 or, or were these placements of these intake footprints approximated by hand based on the information you saw in the map book figures? That I, didn't, I wasn't a part of doing. I didn't actually place that, so I couldn't answer that question for you. Okay, and so those facilities were placed by Mr. Brodsky? Yes. Okay, can we look at SCDA 70? Did you, I guess, before we move on, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Wells and Mr. Morgan, what, what, what part of these maps did you participate in creating? Well, basically, Mr. Brodsky created the maps. We reviewed it and gave our input to make sure they're accurate. And you did that by comparing with the map sheets that yes. we discussed? Mr. Morgan, same answer? Yes. Can we look at SCDA 71, please, real fast? Is your answer, Mr. Morgan and Mr. Wells, and I'm not meaning to exclude Mr. Kinzel and Mr. Ooms, is your answer the same? Yes. Yes. That you were provided these figures and you verified yourself the accuracy of the of the information portrayed on here. Well, Mr. Salter provided the uh, noise figures. Thank you for the clarification. And what this figure though does not show any noise. These are distances, I believe. Correct. Right. Okay. And do you know who measured the distances? No. I do not. Did you verify the accuracy of those distances? No, we're verifying the accuracy of, of where the 
intakes were on the river at, at that point in relation to Clarksburg and, and uh, other geographical locations. We did not, or I did not, participate in the actual measurement of, of uh, the distances. But you rely on these figures, is that correct, Mr. Wells and Mr. Morgan? That is correct. Mr. Wells? What was the question again? You rely on this figure in your testimony? Yes, and I, I personally feel those figures are accurate. Okay, and can we move to SCDA 72? Yes. And you might have to zoom out because I understand what they're saying is that there's a number of stuff on the bottom. <clears throat> and I believe that many of you referred to this figure in your testimony. Certainly, I believe almost all of you pulled it up in your oral testimony. Is that correct today? Uh, what figure are you talking about? This is SCDA 72. Right, but it's what, what part of it? Oh, did, is there only a certain part that you relied on, Mr. Wells? No, the whole thing. I thought you were referring to this particular spot on there. And uh, is your answer the same, Mr. Wells, that this figure was provided to you and you verified the accuracy of this? Or did you participate in some form of the creation of this exhibit? Uh, yes, I verified the accuracy. And was it the same map sheets that you used to verify the accuracy of this exhibit? Uh, yes. Okay, Mr. Morgan, the same answer? Well, there's, you're, you're asking to verify a figure and then you're asking about verifying the map. So when I looked at SCDA 72, I verified the barge routes and so forth by the written data in the biological opinion. And I also looked at what was stated about the number of barge trips per day and then you calculate those out. So that's how they come out to that figure. So if you're talking about the 9,400 barge trips, that's in written form that you're able to calculate. Basically, they're saying there are four barge trips one way to Clifton Court each day, and there's four barge trips to um, Bolden Island one way. So when you do both ways, it's basically eight trips a day to each of those. And so you can calculate out how many barge trips for the tunnel liners and the muck based on the written um, information in the um, in the um, um, biological uh, assessment and using the EIR. Do you know the base map used to create this, uh, the map and the, I guess most of the top left hand side, the figure? Well, that's a, a base map. I mean, that's, you can get that on Google Maps. You can get that on Navionics. You can get it anywhere. So I'm not asking where you could get a map like this. I'm asking, do you know where this map came from? I do not. I didn't create the map. I verified the information on the map. And is this the same answer for you, Mr. Wells? Yes. And Mr. Kinzel, I don't believe you cite to SCDA 72 in your testimony, do you? I used it today as a reference point. I, I did notice that, but I don't believe it's cited to in your testimony. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. I did hear you say that you had collaborated in the creation of this figure as well. Is that correct? No, I verified it uh, after it was prepared. Okay. Can we move to the last figure here, SCDA 73? Mr. Wells and then Mr. Morgan, is this the same answer? You were provided with this figure. You did not participate in the creation of this figure, but in relying on it in your testimony, you verified the accuracy of these facilities? Yes. When you say figure, I'm assuming image of the... I, I'm, I'm actually, I, you're right. Thank you for the clarification. I'm talking about the figure on the left side of the screen, not the photos. Right, yes. And the same for you, Mr. Morgan? Yes, I verified the information on the left side. I provided the photos on the right side. And I, I apologize, one more, SCDA 85. <clears throat> and is your answers the same for this one, Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. 
And then I just need a moment to look at their testimony. There were a couple places where there were, there were sites missing, and I just want to make sure I ask what the correct site was for those sentences. Mr. Kinzel, if you look at page three of your testimony, line 18. Yes. And do you see there where it says site in brackets? Yes, I do. Do you know the correct site for that was supposed to be inserted there? I believe it was the DIR documents themselves or their, or their uh, appendices, but I'm actually not positive of that. So uh, what you're saying is as you sit here today, you can't off the top of your head call the site recall, for that. Yes. Mr. Ohms, looking at your testimony, page two, line nine, if you have a copy in front of you. Uh, yes, on the first page. Uh, page two, sir. Uh, yes, there's a site reference in that. Yes, I see that, but I do see that the sentence references the SDEIS. Uh, what is your understanding of what is the SDEIS? It's like an EIR. And I'm sorry, I can ask questions, more clarifying questions. If you look at your page one, line 26, you reference the FEIRIS. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Is it your understanding? That's like yes. <clears throat> Why is that your guess? Well, I was at the FEIRS is an, like an EIR. Are you referring to the adopted FEIR for the California water fix for July of 2017? <laughs> and you don't have to verify the date. What I'm asking for, are you referring to the adopted FEIR for the California water fix? I assume I am, yes. Did you draft this testimony and insert the sites yourself? I did not. He, I had help doing this. And who helped you doing it? Uh, Michael. Did you read Chapter 16 of the FEIR? No, I did not. Turning to page two, do you see here where you reference the SDIS? Uh, what line? At line six through nine, you have two references to the SDEIS. Yes. And. Is it your understanding that that's meant to be the recirculated draft EIR slash SEIS, I apologize, for the California water fix? I assume. Again, did you not put in the references to the SDIS in your testimony? I did not. Did you review the I did not recirculated? No. I do not know. You do not know. I, I do have three more clarifying questions now. Um, Mr. Kinzel, I, I understand that you're a traffic engineer. Am I correct in understanding that you reviewed chapter 19 and appendix, the appendices that were attached to chapter 19 for the FEIR? That's correct. And you understand that the appendix to chapter 19 was the actual traffic impact analysis done by the Department of Water Resources? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Morgan and Mr. Wells, this, this question is to both of you, but I'd like an individual answer. Did you both draft your own testimony? Yes, I did. Mr. Wells? Yes. And did you both review the chapter from the FEIR on recreational impacts? Yes. Yes, I did. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Ainsley. I have some redirect. There are other costs. Ms. Ainsley, though, however, before you leave, um, why don't I ask Mr. Derringer to ask the question that staff has of you, not related to the cross-examination. Oh, okay. Uh, so division staff have gotten some indication um, that DWR has released an administrative draft of the EIR supplement that has been forthcoming, um, but division staff haven't received a copy, and so we were going to inquire of DWR whether uh, one was going to be sent to the State Water Board or if it had already been sent and 
we somehow lost it. I will do my best to get you an answer while the cross is being conducted. And what I'll be doing is pretty much texting back to the DWR to see if I can get uh, something certain on that for you. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Ruiz, you're up. Good afternoon, uh, Dean Reese for the South Delta Water Agency parties, and I just have a few questions. I think it's 10 to 15 minutes, a few couple questions for Mr. Kinzel, Mr. Kinzel, uh, Mr. Wells, and Mr. Morgan. Um, Mr. Kinzel, um, your testimony, you speak about the uh, Highway 12 uh, extensively. Highway 12 is a two-lane highway, correct? That's correct. Um, and you testify about uh, DWR's error in staging that the Rio Vista Bridge has 144 feet of vertical clearance, correct? Correct. And, and how much clearance actually is that? Uh, how much vertical clearance is at that bridge? Uh, I believe it's, uh, depending upon title, I think it's 18 feet. Okay. Is there um, anything significant about the 144 foot figure uh, relative to um, was there anything significant about be having 144 feet of vertical clearance? I, I think they were, I assume they were thinking of another bridge at another location and that's the, uh, but I don't, there's nothing magical about that number okay. from my opinion. Um, we're talking about barge, uh, barges that are going to be having to access the rivers and it's gonna result in the opening of, 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 of these bridges. You've testified about that, correct? Yes. yes. Um, in addition to barges, and, we, and you've seen a picture, you've, somebody put up a picture of the barges, how much clearance is necessary for barges to, to pass uh, without um, the need to open a bridge generally? Well, most barges um, would clear all the bridges, but if there's a tugboat involved, uh, then they wouldn't. The tugboat uh, are, are tall, they have to be tall because they're pushing and the operator of the tugboat needs to be able to see over the whatever's on the barge, whether it's a, a, a pile of muck or tunnel liners, uh, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it depends upon what's being carried in the, uh, in the barge, but uh, I would think it's gotta be 30 or 40 feet, something of that range before, um, and, and the other gentleman here can respond to that probably more accurately as to what will fit. Please do, if you know. I would say that I can only think of two bridges offhand, one being the Antioch Bridge, the other one being the um, Highway 12 Tower Park Bridge that a barge would fit under um, without having to open. Every other bridge that I'm aware of on the Delta um, would be required to be open for a barge to pass. Thank you. Um, referring you, Mr. Kinzel, to page two of your testimony um, at, uh, which is at SCDA 100 at line 19, you talk about or you write about um, a, there will be a 41% increase in traffic crossing the Rio Vista Bridge um, due to increased truck and car trips by vehicles, et cetera. Um, is that relative to, and, and that is a result of, of a water fix, is that right? That's correct. And, and that is relative to what, what time frame? I mean, uh, is that 41% over the life of the project and, or is that on uh, some other time frame? We usually uh, think of uh, express traffic as either uh, per peak hour or for an average day. And so this, I believe, uh, references, um, peak periods of the day that this is, this is taken from the, uh, uh, originally taken from the appendix of the AR, the traffic uh, section appendix. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I can look at that reference right now and answer that more accurately. Mm -hmm. 
so these are these are hourly volumes. So the hourly uh, volumes would increase by 41 percent as a result of um, project traffic. Hourly volumes are important because that's the, when highways are designed or evaluated. You're we're using the peak hour for that purpose. Okay, and that's relative to existing conditions today, or some other specific period of time, if you know. Relative to existing LOSF, which is the worst condition, and it's. 41% worse than that, yes. Relative to a level of service F is what you're saying? Yes. And, and what, what does that mean? What is, just from a, a layman standpoint, what is level of service F? What's the significance of that? Or what does that stand for, if you will? We, we evaluate the quality of flow of uh, traffic with the level service A uh, resulting no delays uh, to motorists. Uh, or or lower than uh, desired speeds, level service F essentially means uh, stop and go traffic. Okay, thank you. With long delays. Uh, referring you quickly to page three, your testimony at line 24, you say that the existing Rio Vista bridge is recognized as a significant capacity constraint both for river and highway traffic. Uh, what is meant by a significant um, can, uh, significant capacity constraint, and is that related directly to level of service F, or are those two different, um, do, they, do they have two different meanings? Uh, it's, uh, it's essentially the level of service F condition, and the fact that um, from the water standpoint, when the uh, bridge is open to serve the water traffic, the, the level of service uh, essentially goes to zero, it stops, and traffic is uh, waiting. So um, it's level service F on average during the busy period if there are no bridge openings. Thank you. Uh, referring you to page, uh, same page, line, uh, page four, line 14, you beginning there, you begin to uh, testify about the McCallum River Bridge. Yes. Um, is it true that this bridge, the McCallum River Bridge, just has eight feet of vertical clearance? That's correct. And that bridge is located directly in front of uh, a major marina in the, delta, in the North Delta, that being B&W Marina, is that correct? That's what I understand. Um, and maybe Mr. Wells or Mr. Morgan, are you aware of that, uh, the, uh, the proximity of, uh, of marinas to, nearby marinas to the B&W Bridge? Yes, very well. Our B&W Resort is very close to uh, the Highway 12 Bridge. Okay. And are there other uh, marinas nearby? Yes, many Perry's, uh, B and W is just upstream. Perry's is just downstream. There's numerous, numerous other marinas along the uh, McCallum River there. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kinsel. Page five of your testimony, at <coughs> line six. You begin to, uh, you talk about, you say in reality, Caltrans volumes already show 2,400 vehicles per hour using the McCallum River Bridge. Uh, that equates to a, a level of service F as well? Yes, it does. And that will be uh, further negatively impacted by water fix as you understand the project, correct? Yes. Uh, page six, line seven of your beginning about line seven of your testimony. You talk about, and I won't go into all of it, but you talk about significant uh, increases, up to three, four, five hundred percent increases on certain key roads in the North Delta, including Walnut Grove Road, uh, which you expect to have, a, I believe, uh, an increase of four hundred to five hundred percent. What, what specifically are you referring to there? You're talking about number of trip ins. Well, if you if if you just take a point on the road and measure the traffic as to what goes by there in a day's time, um, that's so this number of vehicles crossing a specific point, and uh, according to the EIR um, uh, appendix itself, those are those are those where those numbers are sourced. Okay. Um. You also refer on page seven of your testimony, you list, um, you discuss uh, several mitigation measures or the mitigation measures proposed are ineffective. The third bullet there you reference is uh, 
mitigation major trans IU make good faith efforts to enter into mitigation agreements. Um, based on your professional experience, are, is a mitigation measure that's based on good faith efforts um, appropriate or something that you can reasonably rely on? Well, if it was a, a, a small little development of some sort, yes, but for a massive project like this, uh, uh, with documented uh, problems uh, several times beyond what the street system can hold. I don't know what good faith efforts uh, could possibly result in. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions that are directed for uh, directed at Mr. Wells. Yes. Uh, at uh, page six of your testimony beginning at, well, at line 12 to 14, you you indicate that in your opinion, a large um, number of water sport people, for lack of a better term, will stop coming to the Delta because of the uh, CWF. That's your opinion, correct? Yes, my opinion. And there was some um, testimony or, or references early earlier in, in, this, in the case in chief to other locations or other waterways that, that folks might choose to go to reasonably because there would be lack of delays and wouldn't suffer the same impacts or irritations that water fix would cause. Tahoe was mentioned um, and the bay. Um, there are other very nearby reservoirs that folks could choose to go uh, to um, for boating experiences that wouldn't uh, be impacted by the delays caused by water fix, aren't there? Yes, the Folsom Reservoir, uh, several reservoirs within say 50 miles of the Delta. Does that include uh, Comanche? Uh, I believe so, I'm not too familiar with Comanche. New Hogan? Yes, probably. Yeah. Pollock. Yes. New Don Pedro. Yes. Uh, even Lake Berryessa over to the west. Uh, that's within proximity. Yes. And these are all very, very viable options within, as you said, 50 minutes to an hour from the Delta. Yes. And one of the uh, features of the Delta, would you agree that one of the features of the Delta, or why people choose to boat there, is because of the tranquility, the large, vast stretches of water that aren't subject to five mile per hour zones. Yes, I totally agree. It's uh, that's part of the delta is uh, the, the being way out of civilization. Right, uh, but in fairness, there are also um, limitations in the delta and relative to certain reservoirs. I mean, reservoirs have wide open water, et cetera, that the delta doesn't have. Correct. Uh, well, there's wide open water throughout a lot of the delta. San Joaquin River, for one. There's plenty of water ski places. But there are sloughs in the delta that are narrow that don't exist in, in, in reservoirs. True, yes. But folks still choose the delta because of the uniqueness of it, uh, the location of marinas and restaurants, et cetera, right? Yes, I think it's the overall experience. And it's your view that if, uh, well, your view is that there's going to be up to a certain percentage, I think you said 20% of marinas in your view that will close as a result of water fix. Yes. And you think that would impact people's choices in terms of using the Delta as a recreational location? Yes. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Mr. Keeling is up next. Tom Kaling for the San Joaquin County Protestants. This is a pretty confined panel, but I'm happy if you want to list my subject areas. Nope. Thank you. Go for it. <clears throat> uh, my first questions will be for Mr. Kinzel. Um, you testified earlier that you earned your degree at the University of California. Could you tell me what campus? This was in. This is a Stanford guy asking, because oh. we know the University of California, there's only one. <laughs> could, could, could you tell me which campus? 
If I said Richmond, would you be disappointed? I went to the Richmond Field Station when it was part of the University of Colorado Berkeley uh, Institute of Transportation Studies back in 1965. Now, did you say Berkeley? Berkeley, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Ms. Galen, could you call up? There's an inside joke here I'm missing somewhere. It's too bad I haven't been coming to the hearings. <clears throat> Could you call up um, what would be SWRCB 102, which is the FEIR, and I would like you to go to the map book just found at Chapter 15, Recreation. And when you get to the map book figures, and that opens. There's a set of map book figures for each alternative, alternative one, two, et cetera. Uh, and they are labeled uh, M151, et cetera, et cetera. I need you to go to M15-4. Oh, you have it. By golly. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Kinzel. <clears throat> Taking a look at this page from the EIR map book. Could I just ask if we could make it a little bigger? I'm, my eyes are not that great. I'm having, there we go, thank you. Well, I'm sorry, maybe a little smaller. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <clears throat> Mr. Kinzel, I'd like to direct your attention to the uh, site just above the and to the just to the right of the green section, the Clifton Court Four Bay. Do you see the the, the the label barge unloading facility there? Yes. My question of you is, what if any impact will barge traffic accessing the Clifton Court Four Bay barge unloading facility, shown on this sheet, have on recreational? road traffic on Highway 4. Dramatic. Um, the, uh, since it's here, uh, here's the area you're talking about. And uh, what, we, what we've learned from the study that there's going to be uh, eight trips per day of tunnel liners, excuse me, on, on the old river which will necessitate, and that's just a, uh, barges uh, carrying the tunnel liners, not just ignoring for a second the barges carrying muck to the, to the muck dumps, which are located where I'm pointing. So this is the Highway 4 bridge, and you can barely make out that there's a really sharp turn here. They've, they've made the bridge to be short, so it's per perpendicular to the bridge weren't thinking too much about the highway traffic when they did that. Uh, but there's sharp curves at either end, and there's a, a, a low-level bridge there that needs to be open to uh, let those barges pass through. This is uh, Discovery Bay. There's about 13,000 people that live there. It's a very, very busy uh, commute route, and it's the only okay, way just in scroll and down just a little bit? Uh, other way? I'm sorry, so we can see Discovery Bay. And we flip there. It's a, there's this. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry. So Discovery Bay is here, and the way in and out of of uh, Discovery Bay and the main entrances are are located right here, just a little distance from this bridge. The bridge, uh, right now, um, since there's nothing down here, there's no, there's no reason to open that bridge. Um, we have a, I have an employee in my office who commutes on that daily. He said he's never seen it uh, opened, and I've uh, heard testimony from people that uh, live in that area. They haven't seen it opened either. So now we're saying it's going to be open for the tunnel liners alone eight times a day, and I suspect that's going to be 20 to 30 minutes each time if it's like the others, uh, and plus whatever muck barges are, are needed. So. Uh, it's going to be very busy. If you look further, uh, the tunnel liners are going to be uh, brought here and stored for, for future distribution. 
when they're distributed, um, most of them would be distributed by a truck. And, and the road that, uh, that's available uh, is over here on the left side, Byron Highway, which comes up here and then makes this turn and then uh, goes uh, wherever you want to go. You can go up to uh, various towns. But in, for our case, uh, the tunnel liners would be delivered to the nearest sh uh, shafts. Here's one here. And there's a road that leads to it. But can I just point out to the hearing officer that Mr. Kinzel has his pointer on the screen there if they are interested in seeing what he's pointing at? So this is the road that would be built to uh, for the trucks that are taking the tunnel liners from somewhere in this area up Byron Highway, cross on on uh, Highway 4, um, open the bridge. I'm sorry, the trucks don't have to open the bridge. That's the barges. Uh, over the bridge and then uh, down to this point and from uh, at that point the tunnel liners would be uh, lowered into the uh, tunnel. The next uh, location to the north, if we could scroll down a little bit the other direction, uh, would be, um, there's there's another uh, shaft up here. I guess it's on the next picture, excuse me. And, uh, and there's a road here that goes up to that point. So those trucks, again, distributing tunnel liners would go from this area up here uh, through this um, highway, Highway 4, very congested, by the way, uh, and, uh, and then up, up to this point. When so you said, we when have you a, said a from here, you were pointing to the Lazy M Marina? Um, Rem remember your description in the transcript that nobody's going to be seeing this I'm map. I'm sorry. So um, it's not the it's not the marina. Okay. It's uh, from Byron Highway uh, northwesterly up to uh, Highway Four, and then easterly over the bridge uh, to either the shaft that leads to the south on a new road that would be built or the uh, new road that would be built to go to the next shaft to the north. And of course, this, this would repeat itself all the way beyond there. And, and since this is one of two uh, landing points for the, uh, for the shafts, uh, tunnel liners, excuse me, um, there will be other uh, locations that these will need to be uh, trucked to. One or two of them are, are close to barge landings, and they, they could be reloaded onto the barge, but either way, they, they create an issue related to uh, transportation. Uh, my question <laughs> was with respect to the effect on recreational road traffic on Highway 4. You answered with the word dramatic. Yes. Do I correctly infer that if I asked you the same question with respect to commuter traffic on Highway 4, your answer would be the same? Yes, yes. D dramatically bad in this case. Is, uh, go further. You referred earlier in your testimony to site-specific traffic mitigation plans proposed by DWR. Are you aware that any of those plans actually exist at this time? No, I'm not aware of any. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Morgan? Yes. What's the main season for boating in the Delta? Summer, certainly, and early fall. Okay. Uh, can you explain to me uh, succinctly what you think the effect of proposed California water fix barge landing sites would be on boating in the Delta? Well, as I stated in my testimony, I'm out on the water all the time, many, many cruises, and I'm very familiar with the different types of recreational activities on the Delta for sure. A lot of it is wakeboarding and water skiing. When you're wakeboarding and water skiing, that's not a start and stop sport. Um, you don't go a couple hundred yards and then the boater, the driver stops and then drags the skier past a five mile an hour zone and then takes off again. Um, when people come in contact with that kind of environment, they choose to go somewhere else. And that's what will happen on the Delta. 
when you're talking all of these different five mile an hour zones, it doesn't sound like much, it doesn't sound like a big inconvenience, but I can tell you uh, just by the plans we've seen on the maps, especially in the Northern Delta, by the tunnel intakes, you're effectively closing the river uh, to, to recreational boaters. Nobody is gonna go by uh, four miles or five miles of, of pounding pile drivers uh, to get to the other side. They just, they'll do it once because they made a mistake and then the next time they'll be somewhere else. Thank you. I have, if you can bear with me, two very short questions about outreach. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Ohms, um, as I recall, you are the director of the Lock uh, Management Association? Yeah, I'm the current chairman, yes. Okay, current chair. Uh, at any time, has the Department of Water Resources reached out to you to discuss the potential impacts of the California water fix on the town of Lock? Not to my knowledge. Um, Mr. Wells? Um, yes, sir. I believe you've been involved in this process for a while. I have a similar question for you. Has DWR discussed with you the possibility of relocating muck disposal sites? Uh, I say relocating, locating them other than as proposed in the plan now. No, in fact, I'd add that in my f how many years of dealing with this, uh, DWR has never ever returned a phone call that I've called in inquiring about anything, and I I'll say the same for many other people. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jackson just left the room, so. I, I said to you, you may have just heard me. Ms. Desjardins. Mr. Brodsky, do you still intend to have redirect? I do. Okay, how I'll much time do you anticipate needing for redirect? No more than 15 okay. minutes. That about means that you're coming back on Monday for redirect. Or I just had one question or I could forgo it. I, go I go could, ahead. Um, I could forgo the question. If, if that would allow me to get out of here. Depending on Mr. Brodsky redirect, there might be recross. Oh. I, I leave it up to you guys, but go time ahead. is ticking. Okay, um, let me go. Then let's, I wanted to ask you a question about the construction schedule. Um, and I'd like to pull up exhibit DWR 212, please. Um, and I'd like to go to exhibit. Actually, if it's possible, I'd, I'd like to try to just do the redirect and get it done, if you're willing to forego. Um, let, let me just All right. go to this page for just a minute. 135. Um, zoom out, please. Um, and this is just, um, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but um, they're talking about doing tunneling simultaneously. And what is this document? You need to set some foundation. This is, uh, excuse me, this is the exhibit uh, DWR 212. This is the uh, um, tunneling, uh, this is the tunnel engineering. And I was wondering if any of you were aware that DWR is talking about doing simultaneous tunneling along m all these different reaches. I, not, you mean those uh, straight lines are all? Yeah, each uh, of those is, poten is a potentially a different uh, contract uh, all being uh, done simultaneously. I, I am not aware of uh, anything like that. Um, it, would it affect uh, the impacts you're discussing about traffic and barge traffic? Yes, any of those Hold would on. be. Ms. Ainsley, 
assume oh. facts not in evidence. He's not aware of this document, I, I, I would imagine, this. or this analysis. She asked a very simple question. She did get his understanding, but now she's asking, would it have an impact on the testimony he's given? And I don't believe he has enough familiarity. There's been a foundation laid for that. Justine? Okay, thank you. That concludes my questions. Mr. Brodsky, are you still going to attempt to redirect? Keeping in mind that other parties have the opportunity to recross. I think rather than to rush it, we'll just, we'll come back Monday. And do you have redirect for all your witnesses? I have redirect for, uh, yes. And gentlemen, have a good weekend. We will see you Monday at 9.30 here in this room. Thank you.